Twist of Fate by M. A. Nichols. Chapter 1, Summer 1840, Greater Edgerton, Lancashire. Whether an accountant or sailor, soldier or labourer, every profession was filled with moments of abject boredom. It was as inescapable as death and taxes. No matter how hard a worker tried to avoid it, there were times when tasks became tedious. This truth was compounded when one was unfortunate enough to be a lowly tutor, for he bore not only his own ennui but that of his charges, a fact that Philip Russell bemoaned as he watched his pupils crumble into various stages of mental decay. Melancholy hung in the air like the putrid vapours that poured from the mill's furnaces. The schoolroom was a fine place, all things considered. The former nursery had been cleared of the beds and toys, and three chairs gathered round the table in the centre pointed just enough to face the chalkboard on the far wall, which was empty at present. As most such rooms were situated in the uppermost reaches of the house, they were often cramped and dim, which seemed ridiculous considering their purpose, but the Ashbrooks boasted a fine window that let in enough light to make it easy to study throughout the day if his students were interested in doing so. At least Lucas was not present, as the young man had seventeen years to his credit. Lucas's father was undertaking the majority of his eldest's education, preparing him to be the future owner of Newland Mill. It was now that gentleman's pleasure to hunt the lad down when Lucas inevitably slipped away from his lessons but that still left Philip with the other three Ashbrook boys, and they were in a mood today. Vincent shifted in his seat, sketching on his slate, as he was doing an admirable job pretending to work out sums Philip let it stand. One battle to avoid for now. And Conrad was moderately successful at hiding his novel behind the text he was supposed to be reading. As long as his younger brother did not notice, Philip had not the energy to care what the twelve-year-old was doing. Meanwhile, Nathaniel was determined to fray the last of Philip's nerves. Why must I learn Latin? No one speaks it other than in school, said Nathaniel with a whine that shaved several years off his age, leaving him closer to a toddler than a lad of eight. It didn't help matters that Nathaniel was entirely correct. It was a ludicrous tradition that scholars foisted upon hapless boys. Anyone with sense knew learning a living language was more useful, and it taught many of the same principles while giving the student a proper skill. Movement at the door had Philip's gaze darting towards the opening, his heartbeat picking up its pace. However, it was naught but his imagination. Philip held back the heavy sigh building in his chest and forced himself to remain upright, though he desperately wished to slump in his chair. Even tutors had subjects they detested, but they weren't allowed the luxury of expressing those hidden frustrations. Showing weakness only encouraged the boys to fight him more. Every educated man must understand Latin. Many of the classics are only properly appreciated in their native tongue. Philip parroted the excuse his own tutors had given him, as it was the only excuse he had on hand. Granted, reading Ovid in any language was detestable, but that was a battle for another day. Nathaniel let out a sigh that encompassed all the frustration and disappointment the child's heart could muster, his body slumping as the breath left his lungs, sagging like a bread pudding that had been turned out of its dish too early. If we get through these conjugations, then we might adjourn early today and walk along the river to learn the lessons nature can provide, said Philip, and all three of his pupils brightened at the prospect. Nodding at their distracted work, he added, assuming you two get your sums and reading done in time. The two older boys finally turned to their work, casting aside their distractions and throwing themselves into their assignments. Another flutter of movement had Philip's gaze jerking towards the open door, but this time he found Dotty standing there, watching him with that ever-present spark of joy in her eyes. Her expression shone with it, drawing Philip in like a moth to the flame. Dotty looked a picture in her yellow daydress. Though Philip had often wanted to compare the colour to a daffodil, there was a warmth that muted it to more of a sunflower hue. 
The colour would make anyone else look sallow or garish, but it complemented Dottie's warm skin, playing off the olive tones that made her stand out amongst the pale English maidens. Philip cleared his throat and attempted a smile, but his heart beat a rapid staccato against his ribs, begging him to close the distance, a fact that was not helped when Dottie's lips turned upward, pulling with them the dimples that were on her cheeks more often than not. With hands tucked behind her, Dottie took a few steps forward, and Philip rose to greet her. As he ought to at least attempt a decorous air, Philip swept into a bow. Miss Ashbrook. Dottie huffed, but there was no point in revisiting that old argument. During school hours, at the very least, he had to hold on to some sense of decorum. Though his students forgot themselves from time to time, this room required formal address. Mr. Russell, she replied in a tone that held more than a touch of teasing. Giving his students their marching orders, Philip joined her on the far side of the room. Lowering her voice, Dottie said, Mother wishes to know if the boys might be done with their lessons early today. The weather is so fine, and she would like to have a picnic. That is just the thing, he said. I fear your brothers are beyond my help today, and I have already promised to end lessons early, so there is no reason they cannot join you. Her brows inched together, twisting up as her eyes sparked with silent laughter. Surely you realise Mother intended you to join us as well? Philip fought to keep himself from blushing. Heavens above, he was a man with seven and twenty years to his name, not some callow youth who fell to pieces when a lovely lady smiled at him. I wouldn't presume, he began, but Dottie's lips pinched together as though holding back a laugh and Philip stared at her. At night, he spent far too much time sorting through things to say in such moments, but those thoughts evaporated in the light of day when reality settled in and reminded him once more that he was her brother's tutor. She was far too connected and beautiful to settle for a man who worked for his bread. It was one thing to speak with her about literature and history or their shared love of gardens and horses, but gazing into her eyes, dreaming of pulling her into his embrace, was beyond the pale. And highly inappropriate for many reasons, the first and foremost being that it was never wise to court your employer's daughter and that was the precise moment he realised he'd been inching toward her, leaning closer. Straightening, Philip stepped back and cleared his throat. I would be honoured, Miss Ashbrook. What time does your mother wish to leave? As soon as you can spare the boys, she replied. We shall be another half hour. Dottie nodded, though she made no move to go. Her dark gaze held his, and Philip lost himself for the briefest moment. Despite his bias, Dottie Ashbrook was an objectively lovely girl, and there were so many features he adored, but foremost among his favourites were her eyes. They were so dark that the brown blended into the pupils, and when they turned on you, it was as though the depths of her soul were hidden there. With a blush, Dottie ducked her face away from him and fiddled with her skirts. Though Philip preferred to remain precisely where he was, good sense prodded at him, demanding he ask, Is there something else you require of me, Miss Ashbrook? Peeking up at him, Dottie twisted her hands together. I was wondering if you were planning on attending the Leggett's card party next week. Philip was certain his cheeks were pinking, and heaven help him, he couldn't stop them. Shifting in place, he tugged at the cuffs of his jacket, though it required no straightening. How could he answer that question? The truth wouldn't make her happy? As much as I might wish to, I fear it would not be wise, he said, his words stumbling as he fought to find the proper ones. Dottie straightened, her nose wrinkling. Nonsense! Letting out a heavy breath, Philip shook his head. Just because you welcome my presence at such gatherings doesn't mean others feel the same. The gentry do not want servants attending their parties. You are a tutor, not a servant. To most, that is one and the same. And you are a gentleman's son, she added with a lift of her chin.
a fallen gentleman who died in the gutter without a farthing to his name. Tucking his hands behind him, Philip refused to let his head droop. His father's mistakes were his own, but the words tasted sour on his tongue. The humour fled her expression, and she watched him with worried eyes. You are not your father. Philip shifted in place and gave her a bright and all-too-false smile. So I am to embrace my father's legacy when it suits me and ignore it when it's uncomfortable. You cannot have it both ways. Her shoulders lowered and those lovely eyes of hers studied him, the delicate brows drawing together. Philip held on to his jovial expression before casting a look over his shoulder at his pupils, who immediately began scribbling away at their work. But when he turned his attention back to Dotty, he found her expression lightening and her dimples deepened just before her lips drew up in a smile. Lifting her chin once more, she held his gaze with an arched brow. Protest all you want, Philip Russell, but the legates were quite clear in extending the invitation to you as well. They have no pretensions, and though you are not family by birth, you became an Ashbrook the moment your mother married my Uncle Graham. There is nothing untoward about family attending a social gathering together, and you will offend our hosts if you refuse. Philip's shirt felt as though it were made of the roughest homespun. It itched at his back and neck, and he caught himself scratching at his forearms. Dropping his hand, he tried to hold on to his smile, though he did not know how to explain his situation. The Leggetts were welcoming, but not everyone in their circle appreciated such lowly guests in their company. Scholars were gentlemen of a sort, but Philip had no inclination to reach those intellectual heights, and a tutor with dreams of being a mere headmaster was another thing altogether. But before he could offer up an argument, Dotty stepped closer. Surely you know it does not matter. Philip stared at her, but he wasn't entirely surprised. She had the uncanny knack of seeing into his thoughts and had not an ounce of timidity when it came to speaking out. Please, Philip, she whispered, then with a coy smile, Dotty corrected herself. Mr. Russell. Resting a hand on his forearm, she held his gaze, giving him a look that no man could withstand. Philip had seen ladies attempt such expressions, but too many held a hint of coquetry, rendering it entirely false. However, Dotty's eyes brimmed with sincerity, looking all too hopeful that he would grant her this little pleasure. Of course I will attend, he said. For there was no other response to give to such a petition. Her fingers squeezed his arm, her smile growing until her very soul shone through with such utter delight, and Philip's heart clanged in his chest like a church bell with an overeager ringer. Dotty swept out of the room, and Philip stared after her, his legs willing him to follow. Holding back a sigh, he straightened and turned to face his pupils, who had abandoned their lessons in favour of watching him. Vincent looked ready to laugh, though Conrad and Nathaniel stared at him with their brows pulled low. Lessons, blurted Philip, and Vincent snickered before turning his attention back to his sons. Chapter Two Puffing out her cheeks, Dorothy Ashbrook followed the slow march leading out the church doors. Usually she enjoyed Mr. Rushworth's sermons, but how was one supposed to concentrate on a discourse about charity when it was patience that occupied her thoughts? It may be a virtue, but surely there was a moment when quietly enduring lapsed into the dreaded cowardice or sloth. When did that prized trait turn sour? Dotty was not foolish enough to think herself a font of wisdom at her age, but with one and twenty years of experience, surely she should have some inkling of understanding. Poor Mr. Rushworth likely thought her displeased with the service, as she had spent much of it frowning, but she couldn't help herself, not when occupied with musing about the infuriating Philip Russell. Yes, a few people had tittered and whispered when her brother's tutor joined the Ashbrooks on the family pew that first Sunday he'd attended, but busybodies were always scandalised by anything new, and they would have settled eventually if Philip had continued sitting with them. 
just as Dotty hoped the fool would eventually surrender if she kept inviting him. With the sun hanging high in the sky and last night's rainfall soaking the ground, the air was heavy with humidity and she welcomed the fresh summer breeze that greeted her. Dotty squinted against the sun as she stepped through the doorway. Though the church boasted many fine windows, it was not enough to prepare her for the blazing sun above. Blinking, she cleared her vision, and her eyes immediately bounced through the crowd in search of the man. I shall be a moment, mother, said Dotty, before scurrying across the churchyard. After covering half the distance, she paused, halting mid-step as though she had hit an invisible boulder. Puffing out her cheeks, she sighed and cast her gaze to the heavens, wishing that the Almighty might bestow upon her some understanding of the ridiculous man. Surely spending hours upon hours with him was a clear enough sign that she desired his company. Dotty spent more time with him than just about anyone else in the world, even more than she did with Nell and Isabella, who were not only cousins but her dearest companions. Any lady who spent more time with a man than her friends was clearly enamoured with him. And a lady didn't pester a gentleman to accept invitations to parties or sit beside her in church if she felt nothing. And what of the warm look she gave him on a regular basis? Her eyelashes were about ready to bat themselves off her face for all the fluttering they did. Short of declaring her affection to him, Dotty had done all she could. Philip must know how much he mattered to her. So was she being too forward by seeking him out, revealing herself as too eager? Perhaps Philip required an incentive. Should she encourage him more or act aloof? How was a young lady to know? Men were such fickle creatures, quickly bored with easily caught prey or distracted by more enticing game. Yet Philip was not like those ridiculous gentlemen who cared only for the conquest or the chance to win himself a bride who was the envy of others. Dotty sighed and drifted away from the crowd, struggling to sort out her metaphorical course through this quagmire. What was a young lady to do when her beau shied away? She refused to believe it was disinterest that held Philip's tongue, though a tiny voice whispered a slew of insidious doubts, giving voice to distant worry. Straightening, she raised her shoulders as though shaking off those uncertainties. No words had been spoken, but such things were merely details. Many a man spouted flowery sentiments in the heat of the moment and forgot them as quickly as they came, but Philip's eyes shone with such feeling, even when he did not think she noticed. In her less charitable moments, she might condemn the fear that kept Philip silent. It wasn't as though mother and father would sack him for courting her. He was family, after all. It may be through marriage, but that did not lessen the bond. Yet not every courtship blossomed into matrimony. Dotty's heart shuddered away from the thought, certain that neither her feelings nor Philip's would alter. She reveled in the memory of his lingering looks, for they spoke more forcefully than any words. However, neither could she ignore the possibility. Any number of reasons could keep a couple from marrying, and not all of them had to do with a lack of love. Philip was their servant of a sort, and she was his employer's daughter. No matter how kind and forgiving father was, that was a precarious position. And as Philip's good sense was what she adored most about him, she couldn't castigate him for being true to that honourable and prudent nature, but it didn't stop her heart from aching. With the sun high in the sky, and the air being neither too hot nor too cold, the congregation was in no hurry to leave the churchyard. The children had taken up some chasing game that had them running between the gravestones, though some of the sticklers attempted to curtail the exuberance while their parents gathered together to speak about all the many happenings that occupied their world. Perhaps Philip needed something else to prod him to action. That was an interesting thought. Despite a few young ladies waving to her, Dottie circumnavigated the crowd. She was hardly in a fit state to chat at present. With her mind wholly fixed on that idea, she considered what might drive Philip to action. She stopped in place, her gaze unfocused as she realised there was one clear possibility. 
If fear kept Philip silent, perhaps a different fear might entice him to speak. Gaze drifting through the crowd, Dotty spied a suitable candidate. Young Mr. Atherton was a fine fellow who welcomed a bit of flirting without raising expectations. Turning her feet towards him, Dotty wove around the parishioners. Good morning, Mr. Atherton. Dotty cocked her head to the side, giving him one of her brightest smiles. It is a fine day we're having, is it not? Quite fine, he said with a nod, his own expression lightening as his grin grew to match hers. And might I say you look quite pretty today, Miss Ashbrook? That colour is fetching on you? Fashion dictated a pale complexion, and some people despaired that Dottie's skin looked forever sun-kissed, no matter how much she employed her bonnet and parasol. However, she was grateful for her darker colouring, as more shades complemented her warm tones than the English palette. You are too kind, Mr. Atherton, she said with a sweet smile. And I must say you look quite dapper. Your blue frock coat complements your eyes to perfection. Dottie's insides twisted, though she held on to her coquettish grin. There was nothing untoward about complimenting a gentleman. She had known Mr. Atherton her entire life, and they had exchanged such pleasantries before. The fellow could always be counted upon to give a lady a few pretty words. And their conversation held nothing of significance, yet she struggled to meet his gaze while her cheeks warmed. Thankfully, her darker complexion hid such displays, so Mr. Atherton was none the wiser, but Dotty fought to keep herself from fidgeting. Glancing at the crowd around them, Dotty searched for any sign that others had noticed the interlude. The whole point of this exercise was to get Philip to notice, so if others witnessed the exchange, all the better. A bit of competition might just spur him to action. Yet her insides squirmed as though she were doing something terribly wrong. It was only a conversation. At that very moment, Mother stood with Mr. Bixby deep in discussion. <laughs> of course, Mrs. Bixby was there as well, but if her mother thought nothing of speaking to a gentleman who wasn't father, then it wasn't wholly wrong for Dotty to do the same. But even as she clung to such justifications, her corset tightened and her insides wriggled about like overactive worms. Regardless of what others thought, her conscience wouldn't leave her be. Giving the gentleman a hasty farewell, Dottie turned away from him and escaped to the far side of the churchyard. Hands tucked behind him, Philip watched the teeming mass of people as they chattered on with great enthusiasm, as though it had been a month and not a week since their last gathering. Having attended many insipid classes with lecturers who'd lacked any discernible speaking skills, Philip had perfected the art of looking engaged and diverted while hiding his true feelings. Today, his skills were out in force. Distance was for the best. If Philip needed any further proof of his unsuitability for Dotty, he needed only to glance about at his solitary state to know the truth of it. Though not one to flit about the gathering like a social butterfly, Philip enjoyed company and reveled in a bit of good conversation. Yet no one approached him. Standing apart from the others, he glanced out at the crowd, but remained noticed and ignored. Not important enough for the masters or gentry and too elevated for the servants, Philip was firmly ignored by both factions. The occasional tradesmen acknowledged him, but too often counted him among the lowly servant class to be of much interest. Yet it wasn't the teeming mass of people that held his gaze. Standing there in his solitary position, he watched as Dotty smiled up at Mr. Atherton. No matter how much he wanted to storm about or mope, Philip stood there unable to leave yet despising the scene before him. A wiser man might turn away so he did not see his love flirting with another, but for all his scholarly ways, Philip was a fool and a glutton for punishment. It was for the best. Mr. Atherton was a bit of a fribble, but he had a healthy inheritance and a good family. He would treat Dotty well, 
and though the fellow too often spouted honeyed words, Philip suspected he would be a faithful husband. Mr. Atherton could offer her so much more than he. Are you going to stand there and do nothing? Philip turned to find his employer standing beside him, the gentleman's right brow cocked up in challenge. Tearing his throat, Philip replied, I, I don't know what you mean. Heaving a sigh, Uncle Ambrose came to stand beside him, matching Philip's stance. My wife has told me many times to leave things be, but I don't think either of us can bear to watch this play out any longer. I've reached my limit for lingering looks and awkward banter. Swallowing had been a simple action before, but Philip's throat clenched tight, refusing to move as bidden, and he felt certain that someone had tampered with his clothing, for his collar and jacket were far snugger than before. All the while, Uncle Ambrose smiled serenely at the milling crowd. As you are being forthright, I shan't pretend I do not comprehend your meaning, said Philip. Though I am quite confused as to why you would ask such a thing. I am unsuitable for your daughter. Turning his gaze to Philip, Uncle Ambrose lifted a brow in challenge. What makes you believe that? With a huff, Philip shook his head. Beyond the fact that I cannot afford to establish a household, or that even with the generous position you've offered me amongst your family, it shall be some years before I shall be able to do so. Or that Dotty is quite capable of finding a proper gentleman who can provide far better than I. Assuming I could win her heart, I would be asking her to surrender a comfortable life in favour of one that will likely see her toilet. What about that is suitable? Turning, Uncle Ambrose stood before his nephew, all jests erased from his gaze. Brows pulled low, the gentleman studied the young man, and Philip found himself squirming beneath the regard. No doubt he'd said too much, but it was the truth. What future did Dotty have as Philip's wife? He had grand plans for his future and enough determination to see them come true. But still, she would be required to sacrifice and work and successful or not, wealth was not in Philip's future. There were far better husbands for Dotty Ashbrook. Uncle Ambrose watched him as those thoughts swirled around his head, settling into his heart with the icy finality of one who knew there was no reason to hope. I know what it is to doubt oneself, said Uncle Ambrose, his lips lifting into a hint of a smile that was filled with sympathy and understanding. Some twenty years ago, my life altered irrevocably when I was given guardianship of a tiny babe who had no one else. I thought myself unworthy of the mighty task, and matters were only made worse when a headstrong lady crossed my path and insisted I was doing everything wrong. Uncle Ambrose's gaze brightened, and a hint of humour widened his grin. I didn't think myself worthy of Dotty or my wife when fate dropped them into my life, and I thank the heavens that I overcame the doubts that kept them at arm's length. Instead of being overcome by my fears, I chose to cling to Mary and Dotty with all the tenacity of a drowning man, and my life has been blessed. You are a far better person than I was at that time. I have known you since you were six years old, and I am well aware that you are worthy of Dotty. More than that, I believe you are the best possibility for her. Philip shifted in place and struggled against the pressure in his chest as his heart swelled at the compliment. Brows knit together, he considered his uncle's statement, though it seemed so very wrong. Even if he were a saint, it did not alter his situation. You wish for her to spend her life toiling by my side, he asked. Uncle Ambrose let out a sharp scoff, his smile growing wry. Toil is a part of life, Philip. Regardless of how good or poor your position, you cannot escape difficulties. They are inevitable. Need I remind you that once upon a time, your father's situation was the same you wish for Dotty? yet it did not save your poor mother from heartache and struggles. Mr. Joshua Russell was a fine gentleman with connections and standing, yet it was the lowly Captain Graham Ashbrook who proved the better husband and father. 
Struggling for breath, Philip considered his uncle's words, turning them about in his mind, but there was no disputing them. He'd known both men and their relative merit, and Uncle Ambrose was entirely correct. Yes, but... Uncle Ambrose silenced any protest with a narrowed look, though the smirk on his lips softened his words as he added, And you ought to remember that your financial standing is not as bad as all that. Dottie may not be my daughter through flesh and blood, but she is the daughter of my heart, and I have provided her with a dowry. It should cover your living expenses while you put aside your wages for the school you dream of opening. You will have to live humbly, but Mary and I have passed through difficult financial times as well, and we do not fear Dottie's ability to manage such things. If you are wise and work hard, you will find yourselves on the other side all the stronger for it. Philip's brows rose as he considered the full implication of that confession. Clapping the young man on the shoulder, Uncle Ambrose added, and do not think I tell you such things lightly, for I know that many an unscrupulous young man has pursued a young lady purely for her dowry. But I trust you, Philip Russell. I know your intentions are pure, and if money is the only reason for your silence, you ought to know the future is not as dire as you predict. Then, with a parting smile and another clap of Philip's shoulder, Uncle Ambrose sauntered away. Chapter 3 Glancing about her, Dottie searched for someone with whom to speak, but her mood had not improved in the past few minutes. Her family was otherwise occupied, so they were of no help. How she wished Isabella and Nell were still in town, or that she were with them, Uncle Robert and Aunt Lydia touring the continent. Then she would not be stuck in this position. Of course, Philip's spectre would have haunted her every mile of the journey, allowing her no peace, but it was very cruel of her confidants to abandon her at such a time. Dottie's gaze landed on Miss Haddington and several other young ladies, but she was in no mood for their conversation, which typically vacillated between discussing the marriage prospects of various young ladies and twitting Dottie about her own. Miss Dottie Ashbrook? The voice startled her, and Dottie turned to find a man of middling years standing behind her. His clothes were of decent quality, attesting to the fact that he was likely a gentleman or something near to it, though his manner certainly did not. Are we acquainted, sir? she asked. I apologise for importuning you, but I simply had to introduce myself. I am Mr. John Crabbe. The man gave her a curt bow and then studied her, his eyes tracing up and down her person quite thoroughly, though the behaviour was less like that of a lecher and more like a naturalist examining a particularly intriguing specimen. Dottie struggled to know what to say, for the stranger merely stood there with no further explanation for his intrusion. Are you visiting Greater Edgerton? she asked. His lips crooked up into a lazy smile. I'm a friend of your father? Eyes darting to where the man in question stood, Dottie gave him a tentative grin. Not him, but your true father, said Mr. Crabbe with a shake of his head. Straightening, Dottie blinked at the man, her smile growing with genuine warmth. You knew my father, she asked. Mother and father did not. He was a distant cousin after all, and I would love to know more of him. Were you acquainted with my mother as well? Mr. Crabbe's brow cocked upwards. I cannot say I've had the pleasure. What was he like? asked Dottie, stepping closer as her eyes brightened. Mary and Ambrose Ashbrook were her mother and father in everything but blood, but it was impossible not to wonder about the man and woman who had given her life. Father says he was a gentleman and that I look very much like him, she said. That you do, Miss Ashbrook. Something in Mr. Crabbe's tone gave Dotty pause, but now was not the time for such musings. Her thoughts whirled about, grasping for anything and everything she wished to know about the mysterious Mr. Timothy Ashbrook. Though she had asked around the family, no one had known their distant cousin. Might I ask after yourself? asked Mr. Crabbe. 
I have been searching for you for some weeks and wish to know a bit more, to settle my curiosity. Dotty's brows shot upwards. You must have known my father well to go to such effort. A hand brushed her elbow, and Dotty turned to find Philip there at her side. Though he stood close to her, his gaze was fixed on the gentleman opposite, his brows pulled low. Mr. Crabbe was a friend of my father, Mr. Timothy Ashbrook. Dotty's tone was bright, and she brushed a quick touch across Philip's arm, though he didn't turn his attention away from Mr. Crabbe. Was he? Philip's brows lifted. A clear challenge in his gaze, and Dotty glanced between him and Mr. Crabbe. He is going to tell me about my parents. But that joyful revelation did nothing to ease the worry in Philip's brow, and Dotty didn't understand what he found so disturbing. And I fear I have overstayed my welcome, said Mr. Crab with a bow. Perhaps another time, Miss Ashbrook. You do not have to leave so soon, Mr. Crab. But before Dotty could say anything more, the gentleman swept away, leaving her frowning at his back. Turning to Philip, she stared at him with furrowed brows. Why were you so cold? You frightened him away. I apologize, Dotty. You do not know what sort of man Mr. Crabbe is, or if he is even telling you the truth. Philip's eyes were still turned in the fellow's direction, a scowl cutting across his features. He was a friend of my father. Philip turned his gaze to hers, his expression lightening as he gave her an apologetic smile. Do you not think it odd that a stranger would approach you in such a fashion? Surely, if he were an honourable man, he would have presented himself in a less underhanded manner and spoken to Uncle Ambrose before approaching you without an introduction. But how did he know father is not my father? she asked. Though it is not foremost on people's thoughts when they see you together, it is no secret, Dotty. Anyone could have mentioned it to him, and there are plenty of unscrupulous characters who will abuse another's trust. Dotty's shoulders fell, and though a defence came to her lips, the truth of Philip's words dismissed it. You must think me a ninny. But a smile rose to Philip's lips, a gentle thing that felt like a caress. Not at all, Dotty. I know what it is like to wonder about one's parentage. I was so young when my father died, and the few memories I have of him do not speak well of the man. I'm Curious about what he was like before the bottle took hold on him, but my mother doesn't care to speak of him, and I do not wish to hurt her by pressing the issue. Philip's gaze fell as he spoke, his brows knitting together as he thought on it. Dotty's hand rose to smooth his frown away, but she caught herself before she made such a public mistake. Instead, she contented herself with squeezing his hand, though only distantly and through marriage, they were cousins, and it wasn't untoward to show familial tenderness. They needn't know her feelings were not of the platonic variety. I am certain your father was a good man in his soul, said Dotty, though she knew all too well that wasn't the whole truth. Your mother loved him once upon a time, and I hardly think she would give her heart to a bounder. Whatever he became later, you can rest assured he was honourable and kind at some point. Philip's lips slanted into a smile, that spark of warmth returning to his gaze, and Dotty felt like giving a long, dramatic sigh worthy of a melodrama. Would she ever tire of receiving such looks? Of course it would be preferable if such tender moments led to something more than friendship, but the man was an enigma, locked inside a puzzle, wrapped in a handsome waistcoat, Goodness, that blue complemented his chestnut hair to perfection and echoed the light colour of his eyes. Her fingers itched to brush back the curl that grazed his forehead, with the sunshine playing off his features and catching his locks. Dotty could see a dozen shades of brown hidden there. Philip cleared his throat and Dotty's eyes widened as she stepped away, completely confused when, precisely, she'd drawn so near. Her face heated, though her complexion hid her blush far better than Philip's did his, as they glanced about the churchyard. Might I escort you home, Miss Ashbrook? he said. Miss Ashbrook, 
We are not standing in the schoolroom now, Philip Russell. Dotty gave him a saucy raise of her brow, though her voice quivered far too much to achieve the appropriate tartness that should accompany such a look. His voice lowered as he corrected himself. Dotty, might I escort you home? Lifting his arm to her, he held her gaze, and there was something in it that set her heart a flutter. Of course, it always was a flutter when Philip was near, but at present it felt liable to flutter right out of her chest. Dotty slid her arm through his, and though they had done so many times before, she couldn't help but notice a brightness to Philip's gaze that, dare she think it, was far more than merely friendly. Their steps moved in unison as the pair meandered out onto the street and along the pavement, their feet following the familiar path without needing any prompting, which was well and good for Dotty was certain there was not a spare thought left in her head to direct them. What did you think of Mr. Rushworth's sermon? he asked, though there was a wooden quality to his tone that had Dotty casting glances in his direction. It was marvellous, as always, she said. But what is amiss with you? Philip's brows rose, and though he smiled, she couldn't help but notice how stiffly he held his shoulders. Narrowing her eyes, Dotty added, You cannot ask such an inane question in such a stilted tone and not have me questioning you further. If you had wished to set me at ease, you should have asked me if I have had the opportunity to read the various books you've recommended or told me about some vastly diverting fact you've learned of late, or rambled on about how irksome my younger brothers can be. That filled his grim with proper laughter, and Philip shook his head at himself. I should know better than to try and hide from you. So I will tell you the truth. I have been thinking about the Leggett's card party. Dotty pulled him to a stop with a frown. You haven't reconsidered, have you? Not at all, he replied. Rocking on his heels, Philip scratched at the back of his head and cast a glance at the pavers, the storefronts, the passing carriages, and even occasionally Dotty. I had thought. Philip cleared his throat, his limbs shifting and moving as though the fellow couldn't stand to remain in place, and Dotty laid a hand on his forearm. His gaze fell to hers, and when she attempted to speak, her voice was far softer than she'd intended. There was an intimate quality to it that might have had her cheeks heating again had she not been so lost in his eyes. What have you been thinking, Philip? Will you attend with me? His cravat bobbed as he swallowed, and Philip's lips pulled into a grimace. Then, flashing a self-deprecating smile, he added, but <sighs> I haven't any carriage, so we shall have to walk. Dotty stared, his invitation playing through her thoughts in rapid succession so she could be certain she had heard it properly. All the while, Philip babbled apologies as though the most wonderful thing he'd ever asked her was something of which to be ashamed. I would be honoured. The fact that she spoke the words with tranquility and decorum rather than squealing like a child was something of a miracle. You would. Philip's brows rose, his tone so filled with shock that Dotty didn't know whether she wanted to throw herself into his arms or hit him. Taking his arm again and nudging him along the path, she slanted him a wry smile. Of course, Philip Russell, you silly man. Chapter 4 Bliss was an overused word. The same could be said of felicity, rapture, giddiness, and all others describing the height of happiness. Dotty and her friends had often employed such descriptors while painting, playing the pianoforte, or participating in any of their favourite pastimes, but one couldn't truly use those terms if one didn't comprehend them. To their childish thinking, they knew what joy meant, but those euphoric moments were but shadows of what it was possible to feel. Walking along the edge of River Denick, Dotty twirled a flower around her fingers as her mind wandered far from this place. She hummed a few bars of a waltz, her thoughts churning up so many delicious images, some memories and some fantasies, all featuring her dear Philip. Her steps were lighter than air making her feel like a bird on the wing, soaring and swooping as the winds carried her about. 
The only thing that might make the moment better was if the man in question was at her side. Luckily, his lessons would be over soon enough, and then Philip would appear on the path, coming to her side with a hurried step. Then they'd amble along the stretch of river as they had every day for the past fortnight. Lifting the blossom to her nose, Dottie gave it a sniff, though it had no fragrance to speak of. She smiled at herself, barely refraining from becoming a complete fool by laughing and twirling about like a bedlamite. But was there any greater felicity than loving and being loved? Dotty paused in her steps and considered that. Did Philip love her? There was no doubt that he cared deeply for her, but she wondered if he understood how she longed to snatch him up and make him hers. Puffing out her cheeks, she cast aside the wilting flower and plucked a blade of grass from the water's edge. Ducks, geese and swans floated along the river, picking through the grass and weeds, and the wind danced through the treetops above as Dotty wound her way along the path. This was perhaps her favourite place in all of Greater Edgerton. Some bemoaned the mills and factories that cluttered the other side of the riverbank, but Dotty rather liked it as well. The old town side wasn't as picturesque as the new, but the buildings rose like great jagged river rocks, sprouting up from the water's edge with a beauty all their own. Twisting the blade of grass through her fingers, Dotty smiled to herself as she fashioned it into a ring, wrapping around that all-important finger. Her cheeks heated as she studied the bit of green. Casting a glance around, she pulled it free and dropped it to the ground. It was one thing to be silly in one's own mind, but she could only imagine what others might say if they saw her swanning about like a lovesick girl. Of course, that was precisely what she was, but there was no need for everyone else to know it. Miss Ashbrook. Dotty jerked out of her thoughts and cast her gaze toward the sound. For all that this stretch of green mimicked nature, a road sat only a few feet away, and at the edge of the pavement sat a carriage with the stranger from church standing beside the door, a smile on his lip. Mr. Crabbe, she said, though Philip's words of warning had her casting furtive glances about to see if an ally was near. But they were alone. I've wished to talk with you ever since our conversation was cut short, said Mr. Crabbe, stepping away from the carriage. Dotty distanced herself and motioned in the general direction of home. I do apologise, sir, but I fear my mother is expecting me home this very moment. Perhaps another time? Just a moment, Miss Ashbrook, he said, taking a few steps closer. I have something to discuss with you. I fear I cannot stay, sir, said Dotty casting a glance over her shoulder and taking a few more backward steps. Her hands grew shaky and she tried to keep her tone calm, but the prickles along her skin made it difficult. Just a moment, he repeated, holding up his hands in placation, all while drawing nearer. Dotty gave him a tight smile and turned away. If you wish to speak to me, you are welcome to introduce yourself to my father and seek an audience at my home. But I wish to introduce you to your father, he replied. Her steps froze in place, eyes widening as she turned her face to stare at him. Cold seeped through her veins, settling into her heart. I do not know what cruel joke you are playing, Mr. Crabbe, but I assure you I do not find it amusing. Mr. Crabbe held up a staying hand and motioned to the carriage. And I assure you, it is no jest or trick. Your father engaged me to locate you. There are two men who have filled that role in my life, and I assure you that neither of them is sitting in that vehicle, said Dotty, nodding towards the carriage. The first died shortly after I was born, and the second is at our home. I do not know what lies the Ashbrooks told you, but your father isn't dead, he said. Mr. Crabbe swept an arm forward, motioning for her to draw closer, and though Dotty cast another glance towards escape, he ushered her towards the carriage. Impertinent man. My parents are not liars, sir. Dotty stepped away with a scowl. Yes, they are, croaked a voice from within the carriage. A cane emerged from inside, and a man shifted forward, 
The groom hurried over and extended a helping hand as the gentleman climbed down the steps with more effort than it ought to require. The servant remained at his elbow, not helping the stranger, but remaining ready to do so. The air fled her lungs, and Dotty stilled as she stared at the gentleman. Though his body was frail, his face was not lined and cragged with age. His complexion was sallow, but despite the pallor, it held a hint of a familiar colour. His hair was the same dark shade as Dotty's. His eyes had the same rich brown depths that nearly blended with the pupil. And she recognised those lips and nose, though masculine and aged. The features staring back at Dotty mirrored her own. My parents are not liars, she said, though her voice was a mere quiver of what it had been. She knew her words were true, but she couldn't deny the truth staring back at her. Their features were too similar. I am your father, he said, though the words were entirely unnecessary, for Mr. Crab had said as much. Dotty gaped at him, shaking her head as she inched away. The stranger held up a staying hand and added, you are my natural daughter, and the Ashbrooks have no claim on you. Pressing a hand to her stomach, Dotty tried to breathe, but it was impossible. Her blood froze through, chilling her until she was a block of ice. The only part of her that could move was her stomach, which churned, souring all that lovely luncheon she'd eaten. His natural daughter? A by-blow? A base-born child? I am the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Timothy Ashbrook. They died of smallpox when I was a babe, and I was given to a distant cousin to be raised. Dotty tried to speak with certainty and force, but her mouth felt like she'd eaten sand, and all the while her gaze drifted over the man before her, noting all the similarities again and again. My name is Sherborne Sinclair, and you are the daughter of my mistress. No doubt the Ashbrooks meant well taking you in, but I assure you, my dear girl, you are mine, and I have come to fetch you home. Shaking her head, Dotty held up her hands, warding him and Mr. Crab away. She stumbled backward, her head bobbing back and forth as though that might clear the hallucination standing before her. But Mr. Sinclair remained there their familial ties stamped across his face. Without another word, she turned and fled. Mr. Crab shouted after her, but Dotty ignored him, weaving through the trees and across the street into New Town. Her feet knew the path better than the men following her, and their carriage could never take such winding avenues. Dotty's breath hitched, though she forced her feet along the path she knew so well. Every family gathering came back to mind as the heels of her shoes clicked against the cobbles and pavers, resonating with sharp finality. Each face passed through her thoughts, all the Ashbrook clan, and not one of them shared her dark colouring or features. A distant cousin, they had said, that was reason enough, but mother and father hadn't lied, they wouldn't. Surely Mr Sinclair was lying, Dotty didn't know why, but it couldn't be true. It couldn't be true. It couldn't. With each step, she clung to that certainty, though it moved like an eel, slipping and sliding through her fingers. She trusted her parents. Of course she did. She had known them her whole life. Those two men were strangers, and she couldn't believe them. Wouldn't? But Mr. St. Clair's face sprang into her thoughts, taunting her with his identical features, ones she shared with none of her cousins. Oak Hall came into view, spurring Dotty on, and when she reached the front door, she cast it open. Giving it no more than a perfunctory push closed, Dotty hitched her skirts and took the stairs to the room in which she was certain to find her parents. Shoving the door open, she swept into the library, father jerked upright, and mother set aside the book she'd been reading aloud, but before they could say a word, she spoke, Am I an Ashbrook? Dotty had attempted a calm tone, but it was all she could do not to shout the question as her frayed nerves demanded. What a question, said Mother, rising to her feet with raised brows. She stepped forward to usher her daughter to a seat, but Dotty shied away. I know you haven't lied to me. I know it, 
she said, shaking her head as tears gathered in her eyes. Dotty blinked them away, but heavens, they came too quickly to be dispelled. I am the daughter of your distant cousin, Timothy Ashbrook, she said. He and my mother, Angelica, died in a smallpox epidemic. You were asked to take me in, and you did. That is what happened. That is what happened. That is the truth. Father rose to his feet, drawing close to mother and placing a hand at her waist. The pair stared at her. That is the truth, Dotty repeated, nodding. I am an Ashbrook, and I am not the... She struggled to get the word out. Illegitimate daughter of a man named Sherborne St. Clair. The moment those words left her lips, mother paled and though father maintained his composure, there was no doubting the wide-eyed surprise that greeted Dotty's declaration. Where did you hear that name? asked father. It matters not, for it means nothing to us, replied Dotty. Her eyes widened, her heartbeat racing as she held her father's gaze. He is naught but a senseless man. Some stranger who is mistaken in our relationship, isn't he? Father's eyes fell to the ground and Mother leaned into him, her complexion as pale as Dotty had ever seen it. The lady reached for her husband's hand, taking firm hold of it as she met Dotty's gaze. You met Mr. Sinclair? asked Mother. That is not important, replied Dotty. Turning in place, she shook off the unease, wriggling beneath her skin and forced a smile before facing them again. He is nothing but a strange man who mistook me for another. Clinging to mother's hand, father took a steadying breath, though his gaze did not meet Dotty's as he shook his head and said in a whisper, Sherborne Sinclair is your natural father. But Ambrose is your true father, added mother. He has loved you and cared for you. He took you in and loved you as my own, finished father as mother's brows creased. We are not family, Dotty whispered, her gaze unfocused as she stared off at the wall opposite. Her limbs felt weak and shaky, but she stood there, unable to move. Her lungs heaved, and it was as though her thoughts were one of father's machines, the gears all working together in harmony until some bit of detritus caught in the mechanisms, bringing its movement to a halt. Turning on her heel, she fled the room as her parents called after her. She couldn't face them right now, not at this moment. She needed to move, to breathe. The walls pressed in on her, threatening to suffocate her if she didn't leave this instant. But Dotty paused on the doorstep at the sight of Mr. St. Clair's carriage sitting on the other side of the road. Mr. Crabbe waved to her from the window, and Dotty turned away, marching down the street in the opposite direction. Though the street was filled with the usual bustle of commerce, she heard the sound of Mr. St. Clair's carriage drawing nearer. She quickened her steps, but beyond that she could not contemplate what more to do. Her mind was entirely useless. Dotty, stop, said Mr. St. Clair. The shock of hearing her given name spoken by a stranger made her halt, and Dotty stared at him as he spouted a stream of words that left no impression on her thoughts. Were they explanations? Petitions? Dotty didn't know. She didn't care. They flowed by her ears without making an impression on her thoughts. I do not wish to speak to you at present, sir, said Dotty. I do not wish to speak to anyone. You must listen to me, said Mr. St. Clair, punctuating that with a knock of his cane against the window ledge. I apologise for how I approached you, but the Ashbrooks wouldn't have allowed me to simply arrive on your doorstep. Dotty pressed a hand to her forehead, kneading at the growing pressure between her eyebrows. Please, sir, I cannot. I have waited for too long to see you he said with a furrowed brow. They stole you away from me, and I cannot wait another moment. I shan't. They stole me. Dotty stared, her whole body feeling as though it was made of lead. Please, sir, no more. But his words continued to flow, sweeping her along in a torrent. You have no idea how long I've been searching for you. They kept you from me, but I needed to find you. 
I am not long for this world. Dottie's breath caught, her eyes darting to Mr. Sinclair's. It was clear enough from his visage that all was not right with him. I wish to be your father. I wish you to be my heir, he said with a firm nod. The fellow continued in that vein, both plying her with grand promises and cursing her parents. Mother and father, Mary and Ambrose, the Ashbrooks. Despite believing them to be her cousins, it had felt natural and right to call them her mother and father up to this moment, for she had known no other, but what should she call them now? Stumbling upon that quandary was one trouble too many for Dotty, and she shook her head and ran down the street, ducking down another that was too narrow for Mr. Sinclair's carriage to follow. Chapter 5 Turning in place, Philip marched the length of his bedchamber, his feet wearing a path in the rug. The parlour was better suited for pacing, but as that room was occupied by Aunt Mary and Uncle Ambrose, he would have to make do. The floorboards creaked beneath his foot, punctuating every other step, but Philip's ears were turned to the front door. Seven paces from the door to the far wall, four paces to the bed, five to the wardrobe. Where was she? That was a silly question, for Philip was certain Dotty was walking along the riverbank. His heart urged him to go there and find her, but having lived with the Ashbrooks for well over a year now, Philip had witnessed enough of her pensive moods to know Dotty required solitude and time to think and feel without being inundated with new information. Being beside the river was soothing for her, so it was little wonder that she would be there. Philip could not solve this problem for her, but he could give her the time and solitude she required, which was another reason his bedchamber was preferable to the parlour. The distance made it easier to fight the impulse that pushed him to hurry out the front door and hunt her down. And so he paced. There was little else for him to do, except stare out the window and scour the streetscape which he did at regular intervals. Philip caught sight of a familiar bonnet and gown, and he hurried down the stairs, meeting Dotty in the entryway as she carefully closed the front door. Whether a spark of laughter in her eyes or the dimples in her cheeks, there was always some sign of animation written into Dotty's features, but the young lady standing before him was ashen and listless. Philip helped her with her things, and not once did she look at him as he divested her of her bonnet, gloves and jacket. He tried to hold on to logic, which reminded him that Dotty's behaviour was due to the large burden she carried at present. But reason couldn't keep him from feeling a twinge of rejection at her cool dismissal. Saying nothing, he placed her things on the side table, and Dotty stepped away without a word. Only when she turned to the parlour door did she pause and cast a glance in his direction. Would you come with me? she asked. The question was quiet and weak, and though Philip's insides wrenched at the evidence of her pain, he couldn't help but feel lighter at her words. Stepping forward, he offered up his arm, and Dotty slid hers through it, clinging tight to him. Philip rested his free hand atop hers, and he prayed he would know what more he could do for her. Dotty moved towards the parlour door, but paused, turning her gaze to meet his once more. You won't leave me, will you? Squeezing her hand, Philip shook his head, for he was certain he couldn't manage words. There was so much pleading in her tone, and though he didn't know what good he might do, if Dotty wished him at her side, he wasn't going to leave. But before he could reach for the parlour door, it opened, and Aunt Mary stood in the doorway with Uncle Ambrose just behind her. My darling girl, whispered Aunt Mary, stepping forward to embrace her, but Dotty did not relinquish her hold of Philip. Her mother's expression dimmed and Uncle Ambrose came to stand at his wife's side, resting a hand on her waist before ushering the younger pair forward. Philip guided Dotty to the sofa, and they perched on the edge with her parents seated opposite. The air was thick with unspoken words and feelings, and Dotty did not look at them directly, though the other's gazes were fixed on her. You lied to me, 
Uncle Ambrose took his wife by the hand, glancing between her and their daughter. Besides the story of your parentage, we have always been honest with you. That is a big lie, whispered Dotty. But a necessary one, said Aunt Mary, clinging to her husband. We didn't want you to be tainted by something you could not control. It is not your fault your parents were unmarried and you shouldn't have to bear the guilt for their action. Dotty nodded, though her expression was still so vacant that Philip thought the movement came from habit rather than agreement. His breaths came quick, but he fought to keep them steady. The only thing he could do was sit with her as her world overturned itself and he would not allow himself to get worked up when Dotty needed his support. I am not an Ashbrook. Dotty's voice cracked when she spoke those words. That is not true, said Aunt Mary. And she shifted forward in her seat as though wanting to reach for Dotty, but she stayed where she was, holding firm to her own support. Not long after we settled in Greater Edgerton, we spoke to Mr. Rushworth, and he sympathised with our plight and agreed to christen you an Ashbrook. In the eyes of God and the law, you are one of us. Uncle Ambrose's brows pulled tight together, his expression pinched as he stared at Dotty. And even if that were not the case, he said, you are an Ashbrook in every way that matters. You have spent nearly the whole of your life amongst us, and we love you as surely as if you were our own. Our blood may not flow through your veins, but you are our daughter. They continued to ply her with assurances, and Dotty nodded, but she did not meet their gazes. Her eyes were fixed on her hands, twisting in her lap, and Philip longed to place his own atop them. But though her parents were supportive of his suit, he doubted they wished to see them cuddled up so intimately. Instead, he leaned closer, allowing his shoulder to brush against hers in the only show of support he could give. Did you steal me from my father? asked Dotty. And with her gaze turned downward, she didn't see Uncle Ambrose flinch, though Philip couldn't say if the reaction was due to the accusation, or Dotty calling another man by that title. Of course not, said Uncle Ambrose. I would never do such a thing. He says you stole me away from him. Uncle Ambrose's jaw clenched tight, and Aunt Mary squeezed his arm. Now it was his turn to cling to her. He is wrong to say such a thing, Dotty, he said. I give you my word, I did not steal you. Dotty gave another curt nod, and her gaze finally rose to meet his. Then how did I end up in your care? Uncle Ambrose stilled, his throat bobbing. It was a quiet moment before he replied, You were placed on my doorstep by mistake. Dotty stiffened, her breath catching as she began blinking in rapid succession. Her voice was quiet and weak when she asked, My mother abandoned me. Unable to contain herself any further, Aunt Mary rose from her seat and slid onto the cushion next to Dotty, wrapping an arm around her. Your mother was trying to give you a better life, she said, and it is a miracle and blessing that she chose Ambrose's doorstep. It was you who brought us together. But did you not try to find my father? She asked, looking between the pair. He was looking for me. Aunt Mary straightened, her gaze turning to Uncle Ambrose. She opened her mouth to reply, but he spoke first. What is important is that we love you, Dotty. Whatever has happened in the past, we love you as our own. You're our daughter in every way that matters. Frustration seeped into Dotty's expression, pulling her brows low. Did you look for him? Dotty, began Aunt Mary. But Uncle Ambrose spoke over her. Surely it is of little significance. We did our best for you. Isn't that enough? Shooting to her feet, Dotty heaved in a breath, her brows twisting together. Did you try to find my father at all? she asked. He wanted me. He has been searching for me for so long. And it is a miracle he was able to find me. Rising as well, Uncle Ambrose tried stepping closer, but Dotty inched away. I loved you the moment I held you in my arms, he said. 
You kept me from him, didn't you? Dottie's tone was filled with shock and horror, her feet inching towards the parlour door. That is not what happened, said Aunt Mary. I tried my best, added Uncle Ambrose. But Dottie kept moving towards the door, shaking her head in that manner that told Philip she had reached the limit of what she could hear at present. Yet even as she fled the room, Philip followed after her. Dottie was up the stairs and in her bedchamber in a trice, shutting the door firmly behind her. Philip stared at the wood, and though he knew better, he couldn't help himself. Knocking, he called for her. He needed to hold her in his arms and give her any assurance he could that she was not alone in this struggle. But silence was the only answer he received. Philip sighed and leaned his head against the door. Sending out a silent petition, he hoped there was something he might do or say to set her world to rights once more, but there were no magic words that could do such a thing. If Dotty needed time, that was the only thing he could give at present. Turning on his heel, Philip took the stairs down once more, but the sound of hushed voices had him pausing on the bottom step. The door to the parlour still stood open after Dottie's hurried exit, and though they spoke quietly, Philip picked out enough of their words to grasp the meaning. We cannot. It would crush her, whispered Uncle Ambrose. He is filling her head with lies. We must tell her the whole of it. It is a mistake to remain silent. She is our daughter, Mary. We love her, and she knows it. We must trust in that. Trust in her. Dottie will see the truth without us having to break her heart even more. She has suffered enough and needn't bear that as well. The stair chose that moment to make his presence known, and the conversation cut off. And turning around, Philip snuck back up the way he'd come. Chapter 6 The Ashbrooks sat around the dining room table their plates before them. Breaking a heavy silence with conversation wasn't useful at present, something Mother and Philip were quickly learning. Like starting a fire without the proper kindling, all talk sputtered and died before it had the chance to build to a proper flame, leaving the world all the more bereft for its loss. Even if Dottie wished to engage in mindless chatter, she had not the mental wherewithal to do so. The boys were quiet, though each for their own reasons. Lucas and Vincent were both of an age at which they hardly noticed anything outside of their personal pursuits, and though Nathaniel and Conrad recognised something amiss, they did not understand the source of the discomfort. And so they watched as the rest of the family picked at their breakfast. Dottie couldn't even pretend to eat. She sat with her hands in her lap, staring at her plate. Each blink of her eyes brought a scrape of pain, reminding her just how little she'd slept that night. It is called a fork, and one uses it to lift food to one's mouth, said Philip, raising his own in an over-exaggeration of the act. Dottie's eyes darted to him, and a slight stirring of humour coloured her gaze as she looked at him. He shifted in his seat and she gave him a grateful smile, setting him at ease once more. His jest had been rather poor, but it was appreciated all the same. As we do not have lessons today, would you join me on a walk? he asked. Dottie's lips pulled into a wan smile. At this rate, I shall be the world's best walker. Is that, uh, no? he asked. But she shook her head. A bit of fresh air is precisely what I need. Placing her napkin on the table beside her cutlery, Dottie rose, and Philip hurried to her side, helping her to her feet. Though she did not require assistance, she craved the contact, and judging by the warmth that touched his eyes and smile, Philip did as well. Can we come? asked Nathaniel, glancing between the pair. I want to feed the geese. I shall take you said Mother with a passably light tone. And luckily the lad seemed appeased and went back to pushing around his food without pressing the issue. Offering up his arm, Philip led Dotty to the dining room door. We love you dearly, you know, whispered Father as they passed his place at the table. Dotty's breath caught 
when Philip squeezed her arm in silent support. For all that she thought herself bereft of tears, a few more gathered. Warmth swept through her, filling her with more certainty than anything she'd felt in the last day. Stepping closer, she pressed a kiss to her father's cheek. I know, and I love you too. And never were truer words spoken. In the hours she'd spent picking apart this sudden shift in her world, there was little certainty left, but she knew that regardless of what had happened or what would happen, she loved this dear gentleman and lady. For nearly one and twenty years, they had cared for her, raised her, and watched over her. Such love and devotion weren't erased in a flash even by the most shocking revelation. Yet father's expression did not lighten. He did not smile. He nodded while the rest of the family watched her with wide eyes and varying levels of compassion and confusion. Taking Philip's arm, Dottie hurried them away, but the crisp morning air did nothing to dispel the heaviness in her heart. Standing on the doorstep, she stared at the ground. Abandoned on a doorstep. Dottie had heard of such things, but Never had she thought to hear such a description attached to herself. For as long as she could remember, she'd known she wasn't Mary and Ambrose's true child. She'd spent plenty of time wondering about the father and mother she hadn't known, but they had been snatched away from her in a twist of fate, and she'd been given another beautiful set in return. The Ashbrooks were the best parents a child could want. However, fate hadn't stolen her natural parents away. Was her mother even alive? Mr. Sinclair had given no hint as to whether the woman still lived or not. Abandoned on a doorstep? Had she been left in the elements? Had her mother written a note? Did she ever think of the child she'd abandoned? Dottie's breaths came short and quick, and Philip gave her arm a gentle squeeze, drawing her gaze upward. Despite the fact that many women believed men were devoid of the deeper sentiments, or ignorant of them at the very least, any woman who looked into Philip's eyes would know that was impossible. Those light blue eyes shone with such understanding and sympathy, and Dottie's own heart warmed in response to it. Shaking aside her dark thoughts, she gave him a wobbly smile and started down the pavement, moving with more haste than care. The sooner she was surrounded by trees, green things, and the sound of the river, the better. Having been raised by a mother who was an avid proponent of optimism, Philip had spent his youth having his moments of despair undone by mother's determination to forge ahead with hope. She always insisted that he seize control of the situation or as much as possible, and focus on what he could do to better his position rather than being a slave to his circumstances. But all those lessons and examples were hard to recall when faced with the powerlessness of watching the woman he loved suffer. Dottie was more than capable of managing her affairs on her own, and it was beyond Philip's ability to resolve her current troubles to everyone's satisfaction or erase the agony she felt. He longed for something more to do than remain at her side, but for all the time he'd spent thinking through the actions available to him, he couldn't think of a single thing. Their footsteps moved in unison down the street, and Philip wished, and not for the first time, that he might simply lift that burden off her shoulders and place it on his own. Dotty had done nothing to create this situation, yet she was made to bear the brunt of it. That man sent me a note this morning. Her statement was quiet and vague, though Philip grasped the meaning. And what did he say? asked Philip. Her hand drifted down to her pocket, reaching inside to fiddle with the missive within. He asked that I visit him at the Royal Oak to discuss the path forward. Philip was grateful Dotty was at his side and could not see his face directly, for it was impossible not to flinch at the implications. He forced his lungs to work, though they fought each breath. The path forward? What did that mean? No doubt Dotty was equally perplexed, but Philip couldn't help but realise far greater ramifications for yesterday's revelations. 
What if Dottie left with Mr. St. Clair? His muscles tensed and Philip struggled to keep from crushing her to his side as his stomach sank, making his breakfast feel like a lead weight in his stomach. Do you wish for a future with him? asked Philip. He struggled for an easy tone, but the tightness in his chest made speaking difficult. How had things altered so entirely in such a short time? Twenty-four hours ago, his greatest worry had been about what romantic outings he could afford on a tutor's salary, and now Dottie might be planning a future far from here. Pausing in her steps, she pulled him to a stop as she considered his question. Her head drifted from side to side in some mix between a nod and a shake, sending the dark ringlets framing her face, bouncing haphazardly. I cannot say with any certainty... Though I do wish to know him better, whatever has passed, he is my natural father. Her expression pinched at those two final words, her brows furrowing as she stumbled to speak them. Philip's hand itched to brush her cheek, to lift her chin so that she faced him with all the confidence she usually possessed. But too many people milled about the street for him to risk drawing attention. You have no reason to be ashamed of your parentage he said. Whatever your origin, any sins are of your parents' making, not yours. Dottie's brows pinched together and she gave him a wry smile. You know better than that, Philip Russell. Others might judge you, he said, but I promise that it does not alter my opinion of you one bit, nor will it alter the opinions of your parents, siblings, or anyone else who calls you a true friend. You are loved, Dottie, and we are merely delighted you are in the world, regardless of how you entered it. Her lips trembled and her voice quivered when she said, Thank you, Philip. It is the truth, he said. I only hope you believe it. Perhaps if you keep repeating it, she replied. Dottie reached for his hand and took it in hers as her eyes shone with more warmth than the sun above. As often as you wish. Philip's lips pulled into a crooked smile, and he held her gaze, watching as the shadows fled her eyes. It filled him, making him feel taller and broader. It may be a little thing, and it did not heal her wounded heart entirely, but it was something, and Philip would be glad for anything he could do to aid her. Would you accompany me when I meet with him? she asked, a hint of apprehension pinching the corners of her lips. Philip felt like throttling the man who had caused so much upset in her life. There was no doubting there was more to the story than he and Dottie knew, and judging from what he'd overheard of Uncle Ambrose and Aunt Mary's conversation, Philip suspected it did not reflect well on Mr. Sinclair. He could not guess what the fellow was playing at or what his goal was, but heaven help the gentleman if he hurt this dear lady or the Ashbrooks, a true family. Of course I will come with you. Unable to contain the impulse, Philip lifted her hand to his and pressed a kiss to her knuckles, lingering over it and wishing he could feel her skin and not the leather of her glove. No doubt there were prying eyes watching, but... As that small touch was far less than he wanted to do at the moment, Philip considered it quite decorous. You have only to ask, he whispered, and I will do anything for you, Dotty. Her rich eyes held his, not looking away as he spoke that vow with all the tenderness he felt for the lady. Dotty's lips trembled again, but the light shining in her gaze attested that the emotion was anything but unpleasant. Philip's heart thumped, begging him to tell her everything and anything he thought and felt. But he knew it would only muddle things further. She had quite enough to manage at present without him adding to the mess. Turning, Dotty slid her arm through his again and cuddled closer than was strictly polite. Her wide skirts wrapped around his feet, threatening to trip him, but Philip wasn't about to put any distance between them. With a few adjusting strides, their footsteps moved in unison, following along that old, familiar path they so often walked. Chapter 7 If not for the complicated reason behind her visit to the Royal Oak, Dottie would be fascinated by her surroundings, 
An inn and the connected public house were no place for a young lady, and though she had graced a few during her travels, Dottie had never stepped foot in any of Greater Edgerton's local offerings. In other circumstances, she would make note of all that she saw, in order to relay it to her cousins Nell and Isabella once they arrived home. For, like all things deemed inappropriate for the young, it piqued immediate interest, even if it was identical to any other inn in the country. However, Dottie was focused on her heartbeat. At present, it was making a valiant attempt to pulverise her ribs. The situation was not aided by the fact that her skin felt as though spiders were crawling up and down her arms and back. As she stood in the centre of the inn's private parlour, her gaze darted about the room without truly seeing the chairs and tables, or the large fireplace on the far end of the darkened room. Her parents would not be angry with her. Not precisely. True, she ought to have insisted on a more decorous location for such a meeting, but this conversation required privacy, and the private sitting room at the Royal Oak provided that amply. Besides, it was just as unseemly to be seen out and about with a strange gentleman, and at least this would keep them away from most of the town's prying eyes. Philip stood beside her and Dotty felt tension strumming through him. No doubt he preferred to pace the room, but he remained at her side, never straying more than an arm's length from her. That, more than anything else, helped her to still her breathing and greet the opening door with equanimity. My dear, said Mr. Sinclair. Though accompanied by a nurse, he swept into the room with a presence that demanded attention. His smile was broad and charming, giving her the last push towards calming her fretful nerves. Motioning towards the sofa, he sat and patted the cushion beside him, but Dottie pretended she did not see and chose the seat next to Philip, opposite Mr. Sinclair. I am so pleased you accepted my invitation, he said. Giving Philip an assessing look, the fellow added, And who is this strapping young man? Mr. Sherborne St. Clair, might I introduce Mr. Philip Russell? Dotty motioned between the pair, though neither moved to shake hands or give anything more than a perfunctory bow of the head. Philip remained perched on the edge of the seat, and she slanted him a look, though his attention was fixed on Mr. St. Clair. Dotty brushed a quick touch on his forearm, and some of the tension eased from the corner of his mouth, though Philip did not relax into his seat. Is he your young man? asked Mr. Sinclair, his gaze raking up and down Philip. Dottie struggled to know how to answer that, for though she felt a resounding yes thrum through her, it was far too forward to stake such a claim. They were courting, for certain, but they were still in the first stages. I am, said Philip and despite the circumstances, Dottie longed to throw her arms around his neck. The world disappeared in a flash, leaving just the two of them there as those words bounced about her heart like over-eager bumblebees. For, though it was hardly appropriate to do so in front of an audience, that was the only reaction a lady can give upon hearing the man she loved claim her as his own. But Mr. St. Clair's voice broke Dotty from those thoughts, dragging her back to the here and now. I see, he said, giving Philip another scrutinising look before turning his dark gaze onto Dotty. Well, I am pleased you came to see me, for I was disappointed with our previous meeting. I didn't mean to startle you, but I did not know how else to make your acquaintance, and I have been anxious to do so. The fellow gave a rattling cough, and the nurse hurried from her hidden corner of the room to drape a shawl across his shoulders. Dotty leaned forward, inching towards the edge of her seat, though there was nothing for her to do as the nurse fluttered about her master. When he settled, Mr. Sinclair met her gaze with a weak smile. The physicians assure me I have some years left, he said, but I do not wish to waste a single moment of them. There was little reason to wonder what it was that had ravaged his body, for it was clear enough from his statement and his cough that the white plague had taken hold of him. Dotty's insides twisted, her brows knitting together as she studied the poor fellow, 
fate had taken control of her life yet again, stealing away the time she needed to sort things out. There is nothing to be done about consumption, he said, waving away her look of concern. And I mean to go out in the same manner in which I lived my life, he added. I am merely grateful that, despite the Ashbrook's best efforts, I found you before things grew too dire. There is still time enough for us to come to know one another. Dottie straightened. I do not know all the details behind how we arrived at this moment, she said, but I assure you my parents are not the sort to steal a child away. There must have been some mistake. Mr. Sinclair huffed and the sound ended with a cough. Mr. Ashbrook knew who I was and where to find me, and yet you've never heard my name before, he said. What mistake could have led to that? Dotty didn't know what to say, for she could see no way to reconcile his assertions with what she knew of her parents. Surely there was an explanation, but she could not settle on one at this juncture. With a shake of his head, the gentleman waved the matter away and leaned closer, though their relative seats were too far apart for him to reach her. There is no need for us to dwell on such unhappy subjects, he said. Not when I have just found you again. Mr. Sinclair had such a beguiling grin, the sort that drew one in. Despite the heaviness of the subject, Dotty couldn't help but smile in return. His eyes glowed with warmth, and he held her gaze with the sort of intensity that made her feel as though there was no other person in the world whom he wished to see more than her. It belied the weakness of his body and brightened the room. Raising a weak hand, he called to a manservant who brought forth a small chest. Mr. Sinclair motioned for her to join him on his sofa, and though Philip looked none too pleased with the invitation, Dotty gave him a reassuring smile before moving to her father's side. Mr. Sinclair lifted the lid to reveal a smaller jewellery box, and inside that sat a magnificent ruby necklace. The gems gleamed in the dim light filtering through the sitting room windows, looking both bright and dark at the same time, and the rich colour begged to be put on display. The whole thing was strung together with gold, and a half-dozen teardrop pearls dangled from the red stones. It was a remarkable piece that deserved to be worn at grand events rather than hidden away. With quick movements, Mr. St. Clair lifted it from the box and draped it around her neck, securing the clasp before Dotty knew what he was doing. Then, drawing her up, he led her to a small mirror hanging on the wall, and she couldn't help but gape at the sight of the necklace resting against her collarbones. She was not one to wear red, and Dotty realised she had entirely misjudged the colour, for it looked stunning against her warm complexion. The piece deserved to be worn with a gown of deepest red silk or velvet brocade. Magnificent, said Mr. Sinclair. Then, reaching for a miniature that rested in the chest, he held it up to show a portrait of a woman in an antique gown wearing the selfsame necklace. It was my mother's favourite he said. I understand why, she replied, brushing a gentle touch against the smooth stones as she turned this way and that to examine it. It is divine, she added. It is yours. Dotty straightened and turned to stare at him, her mouth agape. I cannot accept such a gift, she said. It is far too fine. Mr. St. Clair waved her protest away, his entire expression beaming with fatherly pride. Nonsense. It was made for a neck as long and lovely as yours, and none of my sister's daughters have the bearing or beauty to manage such a piece. Heaven knows the wretched ladies my nephews chose to marry do not deserve such magnificence. It would overwhelm them all. Lifting his hand, he took Dotty by the chin and angled her face to study her better. His expression softened as his eyes traced her features. You are such a beautiful creature, he murmured, and Dotty's cheeks heated. Then, with the shake of his head, he added, It is a wonder you and my sister's daughters look so very different, but they take after their father, more's the pity. There's not one among my nieces who is worthy of such a gift. 
Dotty shifted from foot to foot, uncertain what to do with such a mixture of compliment and criticism, but before she could think to say a thing, he released her chin and led her back to their seat on the sofa side by side. You will take London by storm. His tone was so pleased that Dotty nearly missed the insinuation. Her fingers rose to the necklace, fiddling with the stones as she cleared her throat. But before she could speak, Mr. Sinclair leaned forward, his gaze brightening as he took her hands in his. You belong in society, Dotty. A beauty like you ought not to be lost in the wilds of the country. Combined with my wealth and connections, you would have London eating out of your hand in a trice. Wouldn't you like to join me there? See all that town has to offer? Live your life to the very fullest it can be? Dotty gave him a faltering smile. I do not think my life is lacking, sir. Mr. Sinclair waved that away and patted her knee. I meant no disrespect. It is a fine life for the daughter of a mill owner, but you are far more than that. At my side, you could rub elbows with nobility. See wonders and sights beyond anything the people of Greater Edgerton could imagine. London society has so much more to it. Don't you wish to dance in grand ballrooms? Or to mingle with the best of people? Though she didn't care for his final question, as Dotty listened to Mr. Sinclair describe all those castles in the sky, with such beauty she couldn't help the niggling curiosity that wanted to see such delights. A world without budgets or boundaries was something of which she'd heard, but had given little thought, for it had never been within her realm of possibility. Until now. Society's darling. Dotty blinked at that. What would it be like to live in such a manner, to be wrapped in jewels and gowns whenever one wished, to do whatsoever one pleased, to spend one's days and nights at parties and concerts, whereas even one of those events would be the highlight of the month in Greater Edgerton, they happen daily in London. It was intriguing, to say the least, and it was easy to get swept up in Mr. St. Clair's grand schemes, for he'd described them in such vivid and delightful detail. Yet she couldn't quite imagine living that sort of life, not permanently, at any rate. Dottie's free hand fiddled with the edge of her skirt, picking at a ruffle and wrapping it around her fingers. I'm grateful for your offer, but I hardly know you, sir. I cannot uproot my entire life and go off with a stranger. Mr. St. Clair began to cough again. His hand clutched hers in a tight grip as his nurse hurried to his side. When he finally responded, he gave her a warm smile that lit his dark eyes. That is easily remedied. What do you wish to know about me? You may ask me anything you wish, my dear girl. Such a question encompassed too many possibilities for Dotty to think of a single thing to ask him. Blinking, she struggled to grasp what she most wished to know. Straightening, Mr. Sinclair winked at her and gave her a saucy smile. Why don't I start by telling you about my family, he said. Our family. Chapter 8 Oak Hall was a good home, not among the finest in Greater Edgerton, but it was nicely appointed with quality decorations and an air of modest beauty. Something befitting a family of status amongst the mill owners, being neither too grand nor snug, but at times Dotty found herself missing Newland Place. The former was a lovely building, built in more recent years with all the hallmarks of the neoclassical architecture that her parents and grandparents adored. The light grey stone and surrounding garden were lovely to behold for certain, and Dotty adored the airiness of the interior, which had been designed with natural light in mind. While Oak Hall was a blend of form and function, Newland Place gave only a passing nod at the former and favoured the latter. However, it was Dotty's first true home, and she adored the simple building. That townhouse shared a wall with the Ashbrook family mill, and from morning to dusk the buildings thrummed with the sound of machinery and workers, 
Though it had been some years since she'd graced Newland Place, she had many fond memories of that first home of theirs. For all its dark corridors and pokey stairs, it had perfect little nooks for hiding. In the library there was a window seat tucked behind a heavy curtain, and Dotty had spent many hours of her childhood hidden away with a book or staring out the glass at the falling rain or snow. It was cosy and comforting, and despite all of Oak Hall's finery, she longed for such a spot at present. Instead, she contented herself with sitting on the sofa in the parlour. The fireplace was empty, and though the room did not require the heat, Dotty wished the flames were crackling. It was hypnotic and soothing to watch their delicate dance across the logs. She clutched the posy of flowers Philip had left on her dressing table, her fingers revelling in the buttery texture of the pansy petals. Though she longed for something more fragrant, the colours were so vibrant and inviting with the blues, purples and yellows fairly begging her to smile. It was a miracle he had found anything blooming this late in the season. Her dear Philip. What was she to do? That question was like a fly buzzing about her thoughts, never settling for long and zipping out of reach whenever she batted at it. Mr. Sinclair. Ought she to call him father? The fellow was such a lively soul and knew so very much of the world. Dotty smiled at nothing as she recalled the hours they'd spent together and the many stories he'd shared. She had hardly stepped foot outside of Lancashire while he had crossed countries and traversed mountains, having been to every part of the continent and much of America, and he wanted to show it all to her. There you are said Lucas, strolling through the parlour door and dropping onto the chaise lounge beside her. You look glum. I am glum. Dotty huffed and slumped against the back of the chair, turning her gaze away from her brother. Lucas answered that with a scoff and a roll of his eyes. Because you've lucked your way into a massive inheritance, connections, and a life most people only dream of, Dotty straightened and narrowed her gaze. What do you know of it? she asked. I have it from an impeccable source that you aren't in Ashbrook, that your natural father has come to claim you and he is offering you a massive fortune to boot, he said with an airy wave of his hand. Quite the fairy story, don't you think? Gaping at her brother, Dotty sorted through all the possibilities of who might have told him such a thing, though it required no great stretch of her intellect to seize upon the answer. You little sneak, you've been reading my journal again. She snatched up the bolster pillow beside her and swung it at her brother's head, but he battered it away. Lucas shrugged. How else am I to know anything when our parents remain mum and you refuse to confide in me? That is no excuse. Dotty scowled and glared at the fireplace, for it did little good to direct it at her brother. She must find a better hiding place for her journal. Clearly, beneath her mattress was not secure enough. Straightening, she added, You sound so blasé about that revelation. Are you not astonished or horrified? With a vague wave of his hand, Lucas bobbed his head side to side as though considering the idea. A little at first, but when I thought it through, it didn't seem far-fetched either. He never looked like an Ashbrook, and what person would bequeath a baby to the care of a bachelor cousin when they could have given her to a married and settled relative like Aunt Nina? She and Uncle Simon are wealthy and kind-hearted enough to take the child in and treat her well. It makes no sense when you think of it. Dotty's breath caught and she frowned. I hadn't thought of that. Luca shrugged and continued, but to my previous point, why are you so at odds about this whole situation? I would trade places with you in a heartbeat. With raised brows, Dotty scoffed. You do not think it upsetting to discover that the people I thought were my parents are, in fact, figments, and that I am the baseborn daughter of another? Lucas shrugged, nudging the fallen pillow with the toe of his shoe. The people you thought were your parents were little more than mere curiosities to you before Sinclair arrived. 
I don't see why discovering your father is alive should make a difference. Dottie's brows pulled together and her head dipped to the side as she considered that. And what does it mean if mother and father stole me away from my natural father? Lucas frowned. It means there must be a misunderstanding or mistake. Mother and father are far too high-minded. I cannot imagine them doing such a thing, and if they did, they wouldn't do so without good reason. But that only made her brow furrow all the more, for though Lucas's logic had the ring of truth to it, the sentiment gave her little comfort. Mr. Sinclair had been emphatic on the point. He had mentioned it more than once during their discussion yesterday. And though Dottie was grateful for all the Ashbrooks had done for her, she couldn't help but wonder what her life would have been like if they hadn't interfered with things. Shaking away that thought, she turned in her seat to face her brother better. Might I ask your advice? Lucas shrugged again. Mr. St. Clair has asked me to join him in London, and I do not know what to do. I have considered it from every angle, but I am no closer to knowing which I ought to choose. Lucas chuckled, shaking his head. Simple. Go with him and secure his affection and your place as his heir. If he has such a vast fortune to inherit, you'd be a fool not to. The money is not important said Dotty, waving that away. But that was met with a huff, which shows how little you know of the world. You may also wish to come to know the fellow better, but don't forget that he's offering you an incredible life. If you ignore his invitation, he may settle nothing on you. Do you wish to surrender such an opportunity? And it's not as though you shan't see us again. Many young ladies your age marry and leave home, so it's not wholly different from that. You can write and visit often, but you'd also be a wealthy heiress. Waggling his brows, Lucas gave her a simpering smile, adding, Then you could spoil your dear loving brother's rotten, since mother and father are far too stingy to do such a thing. Think of all the things we could do, and buy with a fortune like that. Dotty couldn't help but laugh, exactly as Lucas intended, and she shook her head. You are ridiculous, Lucas. I am right, he countered. This is a prime example of having your cake and eating it too, and there are few of those situations in the world. Capitalise on it, Dotty. And by doing so, I would reveal the truth of my illegitimacy and be painted a pariah said Dotty in a wry tone. Though it had not been the utmost concern, she couldn't help but realise that mother and father were right to hide her origins. Whatever the lies they might have told to do so, she couldn't fault them for that. Some may turn a blind eye, but most people valued bloodlines and self-righteousness far too much to ignore Dotty's tainted birth. Lucas smirked, waving that off. The world readily forgives even the greatest sins when one has beauty, wealth or status, and you, dear sister, are blessed with all three. There will be talk, but that is unavoidable. If not your birth, the gossips would find something else to whisper about. So the threat of a scandal is a poor reason to cut ties with Mr. Sinclair. And Philip? Dottie hadn't intended to ask that question, for what woman of sense would ask her seventeen-year-old brother for advice about her beau? But Philip was so much a part of her thoughts that she couldn't keep the words from slipping out. What of him? The flippancy of the question deserved a heavy sigh and scowl from Dottie, and the young man held up his hands in surrender. I only meant that I do not comprehend why Cousin Philip plays any part in this decision. You are not subtle, sister. Neither is he. It is clear you are enamoured with each other, so I do not see the issue with you leaving for a time. A lengthy courtship is common enough. You say that as though it is a little thing. Do you not think we might dread a separation? Dotty added an arched brow to her teasing tone, but Lucas only shrugged in response. Philip is a nice enough fellow, but do you not think you might find someone better in London? He's a tutor, 
and with all that Mr Sinclair is offering you could marry someone with status or wealth, or both, you needn't settle for Philip. Shooting upright, Dottie shook her head. I am not settling for Philip. There is no one better than him. Holding up his hand's implication once more, Lucas gave another shrug. Regardless, leaving will provide you with the best future. Being separated for a time may be miserable, but you would return with enough wealth to set up the school Philip longs to open. You could give him everything he desires. Are you willing to give up a few months together to secure his dreams? Getting to his feet, Lucas gave her one more smile that was a mixture of pleading and jest, though with a bit more of the former than the latter. Either way, you needn't look so miserable, Dotty. You've been given a gift. Don't throw it away. With that, he sauntered away, whistling a jaunty tune. Dotty stared at the empty room, her heart constricted, warning her of just how terrible such a course of action would be for them. Yet even as she considered the inevitable pain, she couldn't help but see the future Lucas painted for them. Propping her elbow on the sofa arm, Dottie rested her chin on her palm, staring off at the empty fireplace as her thoughts cobbled together the image of what that life would be. Philip had the perfect temperament to manage a school, and it was his greatest desire. He would be happy there. They both would be. The building would be simple yet well maintained, with housing for the boys who required it, a classroom, and then a music and art room. Though he had some skill, Philip was not as grand an artist as his mother or stepfather, and he had little musical talent so she could aid him with those lessons. Dotty gave that a thought. Did young men study such subjects at school? Her brothers were instructed in them to varying degrees, and she knew plenty of gentlemen who enjoyed both, but she wasn't certain their formal schooling included the creative arts in the curriculum. However, as this was all hypothetical, she shook the question away and included a room with large windows to let in the light, with a piano to one side and plenty of easels to meet the students' needs. And a dining room with children all gathered around, enjoying a meal together. While Philip was the headmaster, Dottie would be their substitute mother during those months away from their families. Her smile grew as the picture came together, their own children joined the throng, and it would be so very like her own childhood, but instead of the thrum of machinery shaking the house, it would be the sounds of their boys. And Dottie had the power to bring that dream to life. Chapter 9 Instincts were funny things, for they were easily swayed by other factors and couldn't always be trusted. So, though Philip's instincts screamed at him to bundle Dottie up and take her far from Mr. Sinclair's reach, he forced himself to remain calm and keep his expression passive as Mr. Biller led him and the boys through the offices of Bradshaw and Biller. He was skilled at feigning interest, after all. Don't touch, he whispered, and Nathaniel's hand inched away from the stack of papers before the lad could upend them all. With a nudge, Philip directed his pupil away from the heavily laden desk and towards the wall. Lined with books as it was, the space had plenty of things for Nathaniel not to touch, but none were sitting in easily toppled towers. Vincent followed on Mr. Biller's heels as the man expounded on the legal profession while the other boys managed to hide their boredom to varying degrees. Philip couldn't blame his pupils. From all the interest Vincent had shown before and the questions he peppered Mr. Biller with, it was clear the lad was bound for the law, but to the rest of the group it was dull business. Unfortunately, Philip's own disinterest left him with his thoughts, which were determined to see him greying and fatigued as his mind replayed their meeting with Mr. Sinclair. The fellow had filled Dottie's head with wild promises and grand schemes. Philip frowned at the memory. Mr. Sinclair may be as beneficent and fatherly as he claimed to be, but Philip's instinct settled uneasy in his stomach. Philip sighed, his shoulders drooping, for there was no good to be had in blaming all his unease on Mr. Sinclair. It was the situation they found themselves in that had Philip at odds, not the gentleman who had caused it. 
when presented with such bright and fanciful dreams, few would turn their nose up at the fellow's offers. To have an independent income was enough of a siren's call, but the luxurious lifestyle Mr. Sinclair could provide was alluring. And the more Philip had listened, the more possible his fears became. Dottie may leave with the man, and Philip wouldn't blame her if she did. Mr. St. Clair had a spark that some people possessed, a bit of magic, really. A hint of something about themselves that drew another in. It was more than wit or amiability for many boasted those qualities. It was an otherness that begged those around them to draw close and hang on their every word. This was the sort of man who gathered people wherever he went, who gained access to any parlour or party he wished, who navigated life with an ease that others could never master. Mr Sinclair was beguiling and bewitching and used it to great effect. And the longer he'd spoken, the more Dotty softened. Philip had seen it in her expression and posture. He doubted she'd even realised how she leaned closer to him as Mr. Sinclair spoke of all the amazing things he'd done with his life. If not for the tightness in his chest, Philip himself might have been swayed by all the many stories the man had shared. Do not touch, Philip repeated as Nathaniel yanked a book free from the shelf. The lad put it back with a heavy sigh, which Mr. Billa pretended not to notice. Bringing Nathaniel had been a mistake. He was too young for such an outing. Giving the boys opportunities to learn outside the classroom was important for their education, but it was merely an excuse. Despite all his efforts to gather his wits about him, Philip was far too distracted to lead the lessons, and this outing served as a decent alternative, if not for Nathaniel. Giving the other boys strict instructions to respect their host and return home when Mr. Biller was done, Philip led Nathaniel out of the office. The lad's shoulders lifted the moment the fresh air struck his lungs, and he smiled at the sky, though Philip thought it too sunny an expression for such heavy clouds. No doubt it would rain soon, but such gloom had little effect on Nathaniel's mood, for he raced ahead, sprinting down the road with far more energy than his tutor could muster. As Nathaniel knew the way and was old enough to make the trip home himself, Philip paid the lad little mind as he drifted into the distance. Neither Mr. Biller nor Nathaniel required his assistance, so Philip threw himself deep into his thoughts, though that was bound to be as fruitless as all the other hours he'd spent thinking of such things over the past day. Pausing in his steps, Philip considered that while carts and carriages thundered past, though only forty-eight hours had passed since Mr. St. Clair had appeared in their lives, it felt like weeks. Perhaps that was a by-product of exhaustion, for Philip was certain he hadn't slept in that time, or not well enough to be useful, at any rate. With a shake of his head, Philip trudged along, his focus fixed on the ground before him, his thoughts so full of Dotty that he hardly noted the world as he passed. Mr. Russell. Halting, Philip turned to find a carriage stopped beside him, something he ought to have noticed which only served to emphasise his muddled state. Mr. St. Clair sat inside with the window open and a groom standing at the ready. Might I have a word with you? asked Mr. St. Clair with a tone that made it more a command than a question. I am afraid I must decline. I have a pupil to look after said Philip, nodding in the direction in which Nathaniel had run, though the boy was long gone. Mr. St. Clair gave that objection a wry smile. Yes, I see you are quite occupied, but I insist. I shan't keep you long. The tone was kind enough, but something in it had Philip's teeth grinding together. For the briefest of moments he imagined simply ignoring the summons. However, the man was Dottie's relative, and she seemed determined to further the acquaintance. For her sake, he turned toward the carriage and climbed inside, pulling the door closed behind him. That's better. Far more civilised than standing about the street, said Mr. St. Clair, settling back against the squabs as the carriage rolled down the road. A quick retort came to mind, but Philip held his tongue. 
reminding himself that instincts were not always correct and he ought not to judge the fellow too hastily. Better to be civil, so he nodded and waited for Mr. St. Clair to arrive at the point. I understand you are the tutor to the Ashbrook boys and that you are a cousin by marriage to the family. Though there was a question implied in the statement, Mr. St. Clair's tone was matter-of-fact, requiring no response from Philip. This was bound to be a boring discussion if the fellow was going to continue in this vein. Mr. Sinclair studied him. It drew out for a long moment, and Philip supposed many a person might feel discomforted by such pointed regard. But his stepfather had been a naval captain, and though Graham Ashbrook was a good soul, years aboard a ship had honed his commanding and altogether intimidating air. Mr. Sinclair could never compete with it, and Philip wasn't a lad refusing to fess up to breaking the parlour window. If you think to seize a higher position in the world through my daughter, you are sorely mistaken, Mr. Russell. Philip huffed. I will remind you I was her beau before we knew of your existence. True, but her situation has altered, and I insist you break things off with her. Again, Mr. Sinclair spoke with a definitive tone, as though it was done and over with. Perhaps others might be swayed by it, but it was the command of a man used to getting his way by nature of his birth, not one who demanded respect by his very nature. And again, Philip couldn't help but compare the gentleman to his stepfather. Mr. Sinclair fell woefully short. Miss Ashbrook's true father has given his blessing, and more importantly, the lady herself has given it. If she wishes to be swayed by your opinion, that is her decision, but you have no hold on me, sir. Philip was rather pleased the words came out even, though his heartbeat picked up its pace at the thought that Dotty may very well be swayed by Mr. St. Clair, or rather the promise of a better life in London. Drawing in a deep but unobtrusive breath, he reminded himself once more that Dotty was not one to put store in the finer things in life. She had already made her preference clear. She knew what he had to offer and was pleased with it. There was no reason to think that might change now. The fellow's eyes narrowed, the corner of his lip curling upwards. My dotty deserves someone better than a tutor whose only position of note has been with a relative. You may make something of yourself in time, but even then she is well beyond your reach. Between her beauty and all I have to offer, she could marry far above her sphere, Mr. Russell. Philip swallowed, though his throat was far too tight for it to do any good. They were naught but words, yet they spoke to every one of his fears, dredging up all those old worries and wounds that had kept him from pursuing her for so many months. He tried to swallow again, but his throat was tied in knots, refusing to give him any relief. Do you want to ruin her future? asked Mr. Sinclair. To condemn her to a mediocre middle-class life, fretting over bills, counting each penny, unable to afford any of the luxuries she deserves, and I assure you that if she marries someone unworthy of her in the Sinclair name, I shan't give her a cent. My nephews have already forfeited any claim on my affection by doing that very thing. And I refuse to allow a fortune hunter to steal away my money. I am no fortune hunter. But despite the truth of the words, they came out quiet and weak. Mr. St. Clair huffed at that, giving Philip a knowing smile. I am certain your father said the very same thing to your grandfather, and only a few years later, Mr. Joshua Russell burned through not only his inheritance, but your mother's dowry and inheritance to boot. He had not two farthings to rub together, and if not for his untimely end in your mother's fortuitous second marriage, you and she would still be in the gutter all because your grandfather entrusted his daughter and fortune to a bounder. He was a fool, but I am not. Philip's breath failed him. He struggled to keep his expression calm, but hearing his father's past dredged up in such a moment was hardly conducive to serenity. You are not your father. Dotty's words came back to him, but 
they provided little solace. The differences between Joshua and Philip Russell were stark and vast, but knowing a thing didn't always allow one to erase the fears and pains such thoughts stirred up, and never had that been more clear than when Philip sat there as Mr. St. Clair expounded on the inequality of their match. The objections were far too close to Philip's feelings for him to dismiss them offhand. He held fast to the knowledge that Uncle Ambrose approved of him, but Despite its name, weakness struck with incredible strength, holding its victim in its grip until all one could do was surrender. And hearing someone else give voice to his hidden fears increased their power tenfold. The carriage came to a stop and Philip glanced out the window to see Oak Hall standing a few buildings down. The groom appeared and opened the door, though Philip feared his legs had not the strength to lift him out. You seem like a good lad, but surely you know Dotty is meant for greater things, said Mr. St. Clair. If you care for her at all, you should do what is in her best interest. Cut ties and allow my Dotty to claim her birthright. With that, Philip forced himself out of the carriage and stood before the house, staring up at the edifice that was usually so inviting. Lush green ivy crawled along the cream-coloured stucco, and from his position he saw Dottie's window, though there was no one inside her bedchamber at present. It felt all too apt for him to stand there, longing to enter, but trapped on the pavement. Think on what I said, Mr. Russell, said Mr. St. Clair as the carriage rolled away. For her good, let Dottie go. Chapter 10 Lists were beautiful things. Though not interesting in their own right, they were filled with the anticipation of forthcoming plans and gathered one's thoughts in a unified direction. But most importantly, they provided a distraction, allowing one to fill hours of waiting for the appointed time with something remotely useful. Dottie was in dire need of just such a thing, and so she paced the length of Oak Hall while mentally gathering the many things that needed packing. Of course, such a list ought to be written down, but Dottie needed to walk. Doing so out of doors was preferable, but that defeated the point of this exercise. Her feet had a mind of their own, and they were guaranteed to drag her to their special spot, despite her objections. And then there was the possibility of running into Mr. Sinclair. She couldn't face him. Not yet. Gowns. That was a far better subject to ponder, and Dottie forced her thoughts in that direction. Ought she to bring all her dresses? Mr. Sinclair had said he would buy her a new wardrobe, but surely she should bring her favourites. Slipping them on was like visiting an old friend, and Dottie couldn't bear the thought of leaving them behind. To be in a new place, among new people, without a single bit of home to carry with her. She stopped that thought short, forcing herself to breathe while relaxing her hands. Books. Surely the gentleman had a library, but there were a handful of novels Dottie must bring with her. And though she fixed her attention on the titles, her heart pricked as every footstep brought her closer to father's study. No matter how determined she was to avoid unpleasant thoughts, she felt them looming as she paced the length of the house. The buzz of her mother's voice sounded through the closed door, and Dottie knew they were inside enjoying a book together. Dottie needed to tell them. She ought to speak to Philip first. Surely he would know how to broach the subject with mother and father, but she'd caught only glimpses of him in the past two days, and the secret was about ready to burst out of her. Sheet music. She must bring her favourite pieces. And those she wished to learn? Did Mr Sinclair have a piano? She hadn't thought to ask. But as much as she forced her thoughts towards plans and lists, each pass of the study door forced her secret to the forefront. They needed to know, and Dottie was certain she could not pretend a moment longer. Not allowing herself another moment to consider her actions, she grabbed the door handle and swept inside Father's study. <laughs>
He straightened, coming to his feet and turning away, but not before Dotty saw the shimmering tears in his eyes. Mother touched a hand to his back as she glanced between her daughter and husband, her brows pulled tight together. I didn't mean to intrude, said Dotty, inching back out the door. You haven't, said father with a bright but brittle tone and he turned to face her with a smile that would have been far more convincing if his eyes were not so very red. Please come in, Dotty, he said. Mother motioned for her to sit, and though Dotty preferred to stand, she took the seat opposite them. Father returned to his as well, taking Mother's hand in a firm grip, and Dotty studied those entwined fingers. It was easier than seeing the evidence of the restless nights in their eyes and the false cheeriness that greeted her. Dotty stood on a precipice, her toes sticking over the ledge as she peered over into the void below. This was a necessary step, though every bit of her wish to step back to safety. The practiced speeches she'd written in her head failed her, leaving her insides twisting like yarn wrapped around a knitter's needles. What is it, dearest? asked Mother. I need to speak with you. Of course, anything, Dotty, said Father. His tone was warm and his gaze softened as he watched her, giving weight to his words. Dotty's throat squeezed shut and she shifted in her seat. Surely there was some way to lead into the subject rather than simply blurting it out, but not a single idea came to mind as she stumbled over her words. Her thoughts supplied only dire predictions, imagining all the many ways her parents would react to the news. I have decided to go to London with Mr. Sinclair. Dotty winced, closing her eyes as she pressed a hand to her forehead. Hurrying on, she added, it is only for a short time and I give my word that I shall write and visit as often as possible, but I feel it is important for me to do this. The words were clunky and without the slightest bit of finesse, and when she faced her parents once more, she found two statues staring back at her. Father tried to hold on to his affability, but the man was no actor and his eyes filled with anguish. Mother was no better, her lips pinched tightly together as she clung to father's hand. I assure you this will alter nothing. Dotty clasped her hands and leaned forward, perching on the edge of the cushion. This is temporary, and it isn't as though I would stay at Oak Hall forever. I am bound to marry one day, and then there is no telling where we might settle. The words weren't as polished as when Lucas had said the very same thing, but Dotty conveyed the same message, but her parents did not look as comforted as she had been. Dotty, began Mother, but Father squeezed her hand and her words cut off. With a tremulous smile, Father nodded. It is your future, dearest, and you should do as you think best. We respect your decision, though we will miss you greatly while you are gone. Dotty blinked in an attempt to stem the tears that gathered in her eyes. Holding his gaze, she wished she could explain everything she was feeling, but she hardly understood the whole of it herself. She only hoped he saw the truth of her turmoil teeming in her heart, for this was no simple or easy decision for her. I promise you that this will not be long, father. Mother's brows creased and a frown tugged at her lips. You met Mr. Sinclair only four days ago, dearest. Are you certain you wish to go with him? Dotty paused, giving that proper consideration rather than rattling off the answer that sprang quickly to her thoughts. I am anxious about it, to be certain. I do not know what to expect, and he is little more than a stranger. But that is why I feel I must go. His time is short, and I haven't the luxury of waiting if I wish to know my father better. Father nodded, his head jerking up and down as his hold on mother tightened, and when he spoke his words were quiet. Of course. That man is not your father! Mother leaned closer to her husband, wrapping her arm through his. Tears filled her eyes, pleading for Dotty to listen. Ambrose Ashbrook is the man who loved you and cared for you, not Mr. Sinclair. He is nothing but a... Please, Mary, 
No good will come from this, said father, his voice choked with emotion. Mother's lips pinched, her brows twisting together as her gaze pleaded for father to listen, their eyes locked, speaking to one another in silent supplication. Straightening, Dottie's gaze darted between the pair. What are you keeping from me? Father's mouth opened, but Mother shook her head, holding up a firm finger at him as she said, I have let you do as you see fit for the last four days, hoping you would come to your senses, but I will not allow the Ashbrook's stubbornness to cause more trouble for us. Secrets brought us to this moment, and they will only cause more harm. This truth will hurt far too much, replied father. Dottie's brow furrowed. I deserve to know it. But neither seemed to hear her, for Mother responded to Father as though Dottie had not interrupted. Yes, it will cause pain, Ambrose, but not as much as if we remain silent and allow her to leave with that man. There is nothing to allow, Mary. She is a grown woman. You cannot make a proper choice without knowing all the facts. Lies are not the answer. Dottie shot to her feet. What aren't you telling me? But her parents seemed not to hear, and Mother continued. The truth will come out one way or another, and the pain will only increase with each silent day that passes. Father's head hung low, and he pinched the bridge of his nose as Mother leaned closer, her arms wrapping around him. Do you trust me, Ambrose? Her question was a bare whisper, and she pressed a kiss to his temple. Raising his head the tiniest bit, father met her gaze with a few fresh tears gathering in his eyes. Of course I do. Then trust me when I say she is strong enough to know the whole story, she whispered. Give her the truth and let her do with it as she wishes. Dottie stared at the pair, her breath caught in her lungs as she waited, though neither seemed to notice her presence. As much as she wished to demand the answer, she felt the tide shifting and remained silent as she awaited father's answer. Straightening, he pulled out of mother's hold, their hands entwining once more as they faced Dottie, though he did not meet her gaze as mother spoke. Father found you on his doorstep, but that is not the end of it, said mother, eyes bright with unshed tears. You were wrapped in a blanket with a note from your mother addressed to Mr. Sherborne St. Clair, begging him to take care of you. She must have mistaken the door. All the rooms in the building looked so very alike, and when father took you to Mr. St. Clair's, the wretch wouldn't acknowledge you. Mother's voice broke as she lifted a free hand to point off in a vague direction of where Mr. St. Clair might be. That man wouldn't even look at you he told father to toss you into the gutter, not caring one jot if you lived or died. No father should ever treat his child in such a fashion. Dottie's chin trembled, and the pressure in her chest grew until she was afraid to breathe, lest the shift cause her to burst. We did not steal you away from him, said mother, as the world around Dottie blurred. I haven't the foggiest notion why he has forced his way back into your life now, but I assure you, Mr. St. Clair knew we had taken you in. He could have come at any time and chose not to. Shoulders drooping, Dottie felt her very soul collapse in on itself, leaving her hollow inside. I cannot believe it she whispered, though the words were born from an inability to comprehend precisely what had been said, rather than doubting the truth of it. I didn't wish to burden you with such knowledge, said father. He shook his head and turned his gaze to meet mothers. No one should be made to feel unwanted by those who should treasure them most. Mother lifted their joined hands and placed a kiss on his giving it a firm squeeze as they rested back on his knee before she turned her gaze back to Dotty. I know what it is like to be cast aside by my parents, and let me assure you, my dear Dotty, that Mr. Sinclair's actions demonstrate his shortcomings, not yours. Whatever his feelings are towards you, they are no reflection on you. However, 
You need to know the truth before you rush off to join the man who treated you so callously. Shaking her head, Dottie struggled to form the words buzzing about her thoughts. But surely this is a sign that he has changed. Whatever happened in the past, Mr Sinclair wants me now. He would be a fool not to want you, dearest, said Mother. But I do not think you should trust him after everything he has done. Mother leaned forward, her brows furrowing. Are we not family enough for you? Mary, chided Father. We shan't win the high ground by manipulating her affections. This is yet another reason why I wanted to remain silent on the matter. Dottie must decide without our interference. Mother scowled her shoulders dropping as her gaze fell to the floor. I apologise, Dotty. I do not mean to coerce or badger you, but my heart aches whenever I think of you as that small babe and what might have happened to you had Ambrose not found you. The world is too often an unkind place. Dottie's lungs groaned under the pressure that built as she contemplated that truth, and she turned a watery gaze to her dear father. I am so grateful to know the full truth, for it makes me love you all the more for it, father, but this isn't about whether or not I love and admire you both. Perhaps he was wicked at one time, but clearly Mr. Sinclair has had a change of heart. He regrets what happened and wishes to make amends. Then, turning her gaze to her mother, she added, Mother, I know your history with your parents has hurt you greatly, but if they appeared on your doorstep full of contrition and wishing to know you again, would you turn them away? Mother winced, turning her face away with a sigh. I cannot help but wish that might happen some day, despite everything that has passed between us, but... Father rose to his feet, pulling Mother up with him before reaching for Dottie. With a gentle hand, he brushed a thumb across the spot in her cheek where her dimples usually resided, though they were conspicuously absent at present. But, he said, taking up where Mother's words had faltered, no matter what has happened or what will happen, we love you dearly. With a sigh, Mother nodded, with all our hearts. Dottie's expression crumpled and she burrowed into their arms, holding them tight, though it did nothing to stem her tears. Especially not when Father pressed a kiss to her head and whispered, From the moment I saw you, I loved you, my little Dottie. That will never change. And I love you, Father. Never had that endearment felt so right, for at that moment there was no doubt that whatever else the future might bring, Dottie loved these two dear people who rescued her from misery and gave her a home. A mother and father. Chapter 11 Walking was as close to a miracle cure for the doldrums as was possible. Being out of doors, preferably in a place where one could bask in the beauty of the world, was enlivening. Even on a cloudy day, natural light filled one with renewed vigour. The air was cleansing, and the movement helped to clear the thoughts that dragged one down. However, it was impossible to enjoy this walk when every step reminded Philip of Dotty. The two of them had spent far too many hours walking these paths for him to feel at peace at present, to say nothing of the fact that his thoughts were far too clogged for even a venerable walk to enliven his spirits. At least he was away from Oak Hall. Reminders of her were preferable to seeing the lady in the flesh. Perhaps it was time to speak with Uncle Ambrose. No doubt he would provide Philip with a character reference, and with the experience the Ashbrooks had provided, there was no reason he could not secure another position. If he wished to build a school, he would require some time teaching there rather than private tutoring. He may be familiar with school from a pupil's perspective, but that was not education enough if he was going to run his own. It was less pay, but as Dotty was out of his reach, there was little point in bemoaning the lower wages. Philip the Bachelor required very little, and even the meagerest of incomes was preferable to remaining in her home when there was no future for them. Every nook and cranny of Oak Hall carried memories of her, and the place and people within only brought him pain now that she was beyond his reach once more. 
Carrying about unfulfilled hopes was difficult enough, but dashed dreams were far heavier to bear, and his back was not strong enough to do so while remaining in Greater Edgerton. Deep in those thoughts, Philip didn't realise he'd arrived at River Derrick until he stood in their spot, wondering why his traitorous feet had led him there. The afternoon was not clear, but it was beautiful in its own right. Clouds choked the sky, but they were the magnificent fluffy kind that made one think of downy pillows and thick blankets. There was a bite to the air, but without a breeze, the temperature was rather pleasant, and Philip breathed deeply, catching the heady scent of rain. The past few days had seen a fair amount of the stuff, and the grass at his feet looked all the more vivid for it. The green glowed with a light all its own, giving the grey world a hint of sunshine. The sodden ground squished beneath his feet, and the water seeped into his shoes, chilling his toes as he stood there. Philip sighed and stared out at the river, watching the water flow as it carried the fish and waterfowl along. There were plenty of opportunities for a young man such as himself in the industrial towns, but he would miss Greater Edgerton's blend of commerce and country, among other things. Heart hanging low in his chest, Philip let his gaze fall to the tips of his shoes as he turned away and plodded along sorting through all that needed doing before he could make such a change. With the new school term beginning in a month, there was little time left and he needed to act quickly. Philip! His footsteps froze at the sound of her voice and his gaze lifted to see Dotty seated beneath a tree. Rising to her feet, she snatched the shawl she'd placed beneath her and hurried to his side and Philip stood there like a fool stuck between his heart giving a happy skip and his feet wishing to flee. I've been waiting for nearly an hour, hoping you'd pass by, she said, straightening her jacket and settling her shawl around her shoulders. Dotty fiddled with the fringe, straightening each wayward strand with far more care than warranted. I went for a walk. It was a silly thing to say, as it was clear enough what he'd been doing, but Philip couldn't manage anything sensible. Dotty peeked at him, though she did not turn her face from her task. Have you been avoiding me? <sighs> of course not. The words tasted bitter and soured his stomach. Heaven forgive him that falsehood, but with Mr. St. Clair's words ringing in his thoughts, Philip couldn't speak the truth. Neither could he say more than that tiny lie. This was the precise reason he was spending his free time wandering about creation rather than sitting at home with a good book in hand. I hope you are well, he added. I am not. Dotty dropped pretenses and gazed at him with obvious expectation, and Philip shifted in place, glancing out at the world around him as though that might supply the answer. I am sorry to hear that, he replied. The words sounded stilted and far too formal, but they were all he could manage while Mr. St. Clair's voice echoed in his head, prodding him to take his leave of her. Dotty deserved so much more from life than the poor one he could give her, and the more he thought about it, the stronger those arguments were. If you'd care for her, Mr. St. Clair had said. Perhaps Philip could defend himself against the rest of his fears, but that was one he could not overcome. His feelings were so much more than merely caring for her, and there was no doubt that Dotty could find a man better than him. She was such a vivacious and kind soul, and it would be easy for her to find another gentleman who could exceed Philip's meagre offerings. One who didn't require her dowry to make ends meet. Philip stood there, hands tucked behind him as they faced each other. Dotty's gaze searched his, and he held his heart in check, forcing it back as it rose like an eager puppy, happy to see its master. What is the matter, Philip? Her brows pinched together with a delicate curve that made him long to hold her close. I have much on my mind at present, is all, he said with a curt bow, but I fear I have kept you too long. Dotty's breath hitched, her eyelashes fluttering as Philip watched her heart crumple beneath his aloofness. There was no need to wonder what she was feeling. 
for it was clear in every inch of her face and posture. Her hands twisted together, her shoulders slumped, and Philip felt it all echoing through him, pulverising his already shattered heart. What was a man to do when his conscience dictated two diverging courses? Dottie needed to be free of him, yet regardless of their future together, she was his friend, and he couldn't leave her there on the verge of tears. The two options warred for dominance in a battle that was bound to leave Philip bloodied and broken regardless of the victor. Surely there was a solution to the problem. As a man of learning, Philip prized logic and thinking, but no matter how he approached the issue, there was not. Or rather, there was one that would exact a higher toll on him, and if they were both bound to be hurt, it was better that he bear as much of the burden as possible. And so, Philip stayed at her side. I apologise if I was curt, but I fear I have not slept well of late. He said, giving her as friendly a smile as he could, which was to say not very friendly at all, though it was an improvement. Dottie continued to study him her eyes tracing the planes of his face with such scrutiny that Philip was certain she could read his hidden thoughts. What has you at odds? he asked, before wincing at that inane question. He knew the answer. However, the excuse he'd given her hadn't been a lie. He'd hardly slept the past few days, leaving his mind fatigued and unable to produce anything sensible. Turning on his heel... Philip motioned for her to walk, and though she remained where she was a moment longer, she followed his prompt and fell into step beside him. He kept a respectful distance, but Dotty drew closer, causing him to step away again. The longer they walked, the more their path listed in his direction, and then she snatched his arm and secured his position, leaving him unable to flee. Friendship and comfort... He could offer those things. Those qualities had been the whole of their relationship only three weeks ago, so it ought not to be difficult to return to that former state. Though Philip knew that was nonsense the moment he thought it. One could not turn back time, and once that shift had been made, there was no going back. I understand you are leaving for London, he said. There was no better place to start the conversation, for Philip knew full well that was the greatest source of her present unease. And though the words were difficult to speak, it was better than prevaricating further. You know, she asked. It is not an easy thing to keep secret, even temporarily, he replied. Dottie frowned, her gaze dropping to her toes. I wanted to tell you myself, and I promise I was going to tell all. But things are so wretched at present. I do not wish to hurt my parents or you, but I truly feel this is what I meant to do. With that, she began reciting all that had happened, some of which he'd known and some of which he hadn't. Regardless, Philip led her along the bank of the river as she unburdened her heart. Listening was the only comfort he could offer. Surely the knights of old had had a far easier job to do, even if one was required to battle a dragon, a fellow could take arms against that beast, which was far more satisfying than standing there as his lady's heart broke. Pulling him to a stop, Dotty stood before him, her shoulders slumped and her expression twisted. I am trying my best to do what is right, but it seems I am to hurt someone no matter what I choose. I owe so much to mother and father, and I love them dearly, but don't I owe something to Mr. St. Clair? He wishes to atone for the past, and he is my father, even if he did not wish to acknowledge it before. With a sigh, Dottie leaned forward, pressing her forehead against his shoulder. Luckily, her bonnet had a short brim, allowing her to nestle there. Speak sense to me, Philip. You are so clever and see things so clearly, and I am in dire need of your guidance. The trees around them provided enough privacy that Philip brought his arms around her, holding her close. His hands rubbed circles on her back and she sighed as the tension in her muscles eased at his touch. You are an intelligent woman, Dotty, and you take great care with the feelings of those around you. You have been put in an unenviable position, but I have every faith you will sort it out. Straightening, Dotty gave him a watery smile. <laughs>
I know, I simply wish I could make everyone happy, but I fear I am only going to cause pain. Whatever happens, your family loves you. That will never change, he said with a tender smile. Those words brought a spark of light back into her eyes, and Philip felt as though he'd slayed the dragon, or managed to wound it at the very least. His chest expanded as he gazed upon her, those pretty little dimples even making an appearance. Reaching up, he brushed aside a tear. And then he realised how close they were standing. Clearing his throat, he inched backward, his smile straining at the edges as he struggled to identify when, precisely, he'd lost sight of what he was supposed to be doing. Friendship and comfort, that was all, not leaning closer to steal a kiss, and he couldn't deny that he'd been thinking about that very thing. You shall sort it out, he said with a firm nod. I have every faith in you. Like a candle in a breeze, the light in her eyes snuffed out and that troubled expression returned to Dottie's face, erasing the modicum of peace he'd given her as though it had never existed. What is the matter, Philip? Chapter 12 Studying his features, Dottie tried to discern what was stirring beneath Philip's stony facade. Oh... He put on a good show of feigning warmth, but she felt the emotional distance between them as if it were a palpable thing. So much had altered in her life of late, and she could not stand for her last bit of stability to crumble beneath her feet. We shall be separated for a short time, but it will be for our good, I promise, she said, reaching for his hand. Philip nodded, but he looked more like a marionette being led about by his strings than a living, breathing man. He motioned for them to continue walking, but Dottie shook her head, not allowing him another diversion. Tease, Philip. I know this will be difficult, but we can weather it. When that received yet another silent nod, she frowned, her thoughts churning through possible sources of his discomfort. Grasping another thread, she pulled. If nothing else, I feel it is important to do what I can to help my father. He has made many mistakes, but clearly he wishes to make amends. Isn't it my duty to aid him? Mother is always speaking about needing to forgive family when Uncle Nicholas is being difficult or Lucas is plaguing me. Should we not extend the same courtesy to my father as well? That is true for most squabbles or disagreements, he said. The world would be better if we all chose to forgive rather than harbour ill feelings. But simply because one is family doesn't mean you ought to suffer ill treatment or maliciousness. A blood tie does not give one licence to mistreat another. Philip tucked his hands behind him, and Dottie held back a smile at the sign of life returning to him. Taking him by the arm, Dottie nudged them down the path once more, weaving between the trees lining the riverbank. True, but Mr. St. Clair seems like a pleasant fellow and is eager for my company. Surely, if he has changed, I ought not to hold his past wickedness against him. But her words trailed away when Philip stiffened and tried drifting from her side once again, as though she would not notice it. Yanking him to a stop, Dottie whirled on him. What is it, Philip? I know something is amiss and you will not tell me. Please speak to me. A breath hitched and she fought to keep her expression calm, but Dottie's heart would not be silenced. It fluttered in her chest like a bird fighting its cage. Her voice broke and in another time she would have winced at the tears gathering and the utter spectacle she was making of herself, but after everything the past week she had no strength left for social niceties. I cannot bear to lose you. Philip's head hung low, but still he continued to inch away from her. Dottie stilled. Was he done with her? Had his feelings changed? That sent a ripple of panic coursing through her, making everything inside her tense. Philip did not care for her any more. Her heart gave an unhappy thump at that whirlwind of emotion, and she straightened, considering the situation. Surely she knew better than to give way to such silly thoughts. Philip was one of her dearest friends, 
months together had taught her much about him, and the past three weeks had refined that closeness of spirit they shared. Though all the evidence before her eyes affirmed her fears, her heart would not accept them. Philip had not altered so greatly in such a short time. And that gave her the strength to cast aside her tears. Staring at the man, Dotty said in a firm, unyielding tone, Tell me this instant, Philip Russell. I know something is amiss, and I will not allow myself to get swept up in silly fears and doubts. I demand you speak the truth. I am tired of lies and secrets. Philip shifted from foot to foot, his eyes unable to meet hers. The moment stretched out with a weighty silence, but Dotty would not be deterred. Staring at his lowered head, she willed him to speak. You can do better than me, he mumbled. Dotty stared at him as the breath left her lungs. He cast a furtive glance at her, rounding his shoulders. With Mr. St. Clair's connections and wealth, you could have any man of your choosing. You needn't settle for a poor tutor. Though she heard every word as they fell from his lips, Dotty couldn't believe he had spoken them. He'd abandoned such ludicrous sentiments weeks ago. Or she thought he had when he'd first offered to escort her to the Leggett's card party. They had already fought this battle and emerged victorious, else they wouldn't be courting. However, there was no denying that his distorted view of his value was still an immutable yet very incorrect truth in his mind. That is ridiculous, she whispered, shaking her head. Why must she say this again and again? Would no one believe her? I am not settling. He huffed, shaking his head in return. I am nothing, Dotty, a gentleman in only the loosest of definitions who has no higher aspirations than being a schoolmaster, a poor nothing who hasn't enough income to afford a wife, the son of a reprobate. In London you can find someone far better than me. Don't you dare say such a thing, Philip Russell. Dotty spat the words, scowling at that lunacy. Then, stepping closer, she took his hands in hers, drawing his gaze, pleading with her eyes that he might believe her words, for she felt them to her very core. The words burned in her, blazing with all the strength of her heart. I cannot find a better man, for there is none. Philip stared at their joined hands. If I work hard the whole of my life, I can give you a comfortable life, but nothing like what those London gentlemen can give you. And what does that matter? I would rather live a poor life with you than a wealthy one with someone else. Dotty huffed, and then with a squeeze of his hand, she added another truth she felt was buried deep beneath those fears. Income is not the measure of a man's worth. You work hard and try your best to be a good man, Philip. What more could someone possibly give me? A flash of hope brightened his gaze for a moment, but Dotty saw too many doubts lingering there. Brushing her thumbs across the back of his hand, she looked into her heart and found the words she knew she needed to say. When I imagine my future, do you know what I see? She asked, though she did not wait for an answer. I do not fantasise about grand balls or lavish parties. There are no expensive gowns or jewellery. I see our school. One by one, she laid out all the many dreams she fostered. The little details amounted to nothing amongst the highest echelons of society, but meant all the more to her, for they were the heart and soul of the family that had raised her and would be the foundation of the one she longed to establish with Philip. Happiness was not made from silks, rubies and gold, but from kinship and community. From building a harbour amidst the chaos of life. Her words wrapped around Philip's heart as she described the life she pictured for herself. Her lovely dimples peeking out as her gaze drifted from him, staring off into that future. Her words flowed steadily and without hesitation making it clear she'd given the subject much thought. Philip struggled to breathe as his chest tightened, his pulse thumped a heavy beat, echoing in time with hers as she shared it all with him.
Dotty drifted closer and his arms moved of their own accord, wrapping around her. She was so preoccupied with those dreams that he doubted she noticed the shift in their position or that her fingers drifted up to fiddle with the lapels of his waistcoat. If he were a better man, he would put distance between them, but even as Philip thought that, his heart shuddered and cast the thought aside to focus on Dotty's words. The voices in his head trotted out all his doubts and fears, giving those insidious whispers such strength, attempting to drown her out, but Dotty's sweet voice called loudest, begging him to believe in her. To believe in them. It may not be a grand life, but it is what I want, Philip, she said, her eyes focusing on him once more. You say my father's fortune will secure my future, and I agree, but not the future you think. His support would mean that we could achieve that dream all the sooner. I cannot do much to further your professional endeavours, but I can do this. Philip kissed her. There was nothing else he could do at such a moment. His heart couldn't be contained any longer. She may think there was no better man than he, but Philip knew there was no better woman than her. Dotty Ashbrook was magnificent, and if he'd had any doubt before that moment, he had none now. Whether or not he deserved her, Philip wouldn't let her go. Good gracious, this was as close to heaven as any person could attain in this plane of existence. Surely there was no grander feeling than being held tenderly by the man she loved. Dotty felt like dancing about, but that would necessitate her stepping away from Philip, and she was not about to surrender his kiss. It was so much more than she'd imagined. She'd spent many hours puzzling out what his lips felt like and the loving touches that might accompany it, and while those fantasies were quite nice, enthralling, really, Dotty was not prepared for the overwhelming emotions that accompanied his embrace. She felt ready to shake apart from the strength of her joy, and the only thing holding her together was the overwhelming sense of rightness she felt at his touch. I love you, Dotty, he whispered. A bright smile stretched across his face, and Philip's heart shone in his eyes, testifying far better than his words just how much she meant to him. I do not know if I can ever be worthy of you. She pressed a quick buzz to his lips, silencing that wretched statement. You are everything I want, Philip Russell, and everything I could ever hope for. I love you with all my heart. This is why I wish to go to London. I can give us that beautiful future together. Don't you want that? I'd rather have you at my side. Dottie's brows rose, her eyes filling with new tears as all those feelings surged once more at the strength of his declaration. There was no hesitancy, no question. Philip wanted her at his side more than he wanted his dream. He leaned forward, but a distant whoop of laughter accompanied by shrill whistles had the pair jumping away from each other, their gazes darting about to find the source. A pair of workmen were trodding the street that followed their patch of green, their smiles and catcalls reminding the two that they were not in private. Dotty's cheeks heated, and when she turned her gaze back to Philip, she laughed at the sight of his own rosy complexion. With a nod of his head, he motioned for them to continue on their way. Frowning at the interruption, she took his arm, sidling up close to him. If they weren't to be allowed more embraces, she would settle for that. Grinning at the overcast skies, Dotty held fast to her Philip as they meandered along, listening to the ripples of the water. There is something I need to tell you, said Philip. Turning a pretty smile towards him, Dotty was about to give a coy response, but the seriousness of his expression held her tongue. Philip's brows pulled together and she wanted to reach over and smooth the wrinkles away. What is it? she asked. Slanting a look her way, Philip paused and turned to face her. Mr. St. Clair sought me out for a private conversation a few days ago. Chapter 13
The Royal Oak was the finest inn in town, which was not much of a boast, but it was one the establishment touted despite the rather mixed company who found themselves frequenting it. As Greater Edgerton was not along any major thoroughfare, nor was it significant in its own right, the town did not see large numbers of travellers. Thus its inns were more popular for their public houses than the array of beds they offered. There were no nearby nobles to give the place panache, and so the haughty innkeeper settled for Greater Edgerton's elite, who were little better than tradesmen. Unfortunately, even their patronage couldn't keep the royal oak afloat, leaving the innkeeper stuck between a proverbial rock and a hard place, namely his pride and his purse. And the former won out, allowing him to smile at the varied clientele who crossed his threshold while grimacing in private at the affront to his dignity. The public house was bursting at the seams, and if there was one truth to be found at the bottom of an ale glass, it was that spirits were no respecter of people. Whether a pauper or prince, a man in its grip acted the fool. A cheer rose from inside as the fellows raised another tankard to salute some bit of ridiculousness, though Dotty could not see any rhyme or reason to the outburst. Are you certain you wish to do this? asked Philip as they stood side by side, staring through the front window. Dotty sighed, turning a narrowed look his way. They had discussed the matter so many times over the past few hours and there was nothing more to say on the subject. Though her inside squirmed at what was to come, there was no avoiding what needed to be done. Leaning closer to the glass, she peered inside and searched the crowd. Despite the raucousness, her father was easy enough to spy. Her brows shot upwards as he threw back another swig of his tankard, his arm draped around the barmaid seated beside him. Or at least Dotty thought the woman was in a separate seat, but the pair were so cosily situated it was difficult to tell. I think I shall fetch him, said Philip in a flat tone as they watched the fellow lean in close to whisper in the young woman's ear, his lips subtly brushing a kiss on her neck as his companion giggled. Dotty nodded, unable to turn away from the scene. Philip squeezed her hand and walked through the front door. Weaving through the other patrons, he stopped beside Mr. St. Clair's chair. Even if the room were empty, Dotty wouldn't have heard the words, but it was easy enough to see from his expression that her father wasn't pleased to see Philip. Taking in a deep breath, she tried to calm her roiling insides, but they were determined to twist themselves into knots. Philip motioned towards the window, and her father glanced up to meet her gaze. Straightening, he ignored Philip entirely as he rose to his feet, leaving the inn and coming to Dotty's side to greet her with a wide smile. This is an unexpected pleasure. It is good to see you, my girl. Dotty tried to match his smile. You are looking well, she said. Mr. Sinclair nodded and said, I have my good days and thank the heavens. Today is one of them. Come, join me in the parlour. There is no need to stand about in the street. Glancing back at the inn, Dotty shook her head as the image of the barmaid hanging on her father flashed through her mind. Nor did she wish to test her mettle in that crowd. She trusted Philip to help her through it, but there was no need when the sun still shone. It would be a shame to waste this beautiful day, and the churchyard is not far from here. There are some benches there we might use, she said. The fellow glanced at the thick clouds hanging overhead and gave her a wry smile, but he did not argue, choosing instead to send for his greatcoat. Stepping between her and Philip, Mr. Sinclair took Dotty's arm and they strolled down the street. She cast a glance over her shoulder and gave Philip an encouraging smile, and he nodded in response, though his gaze remained fixed on her father. I cannot wait to introduce you to all the sights of London, Dotty, he said as she led them down the street. Though he seemed capable of walking, his wheezing breaths had her slowing her pace. Every night is a new delight. The choices are endless, for there are always more offerings. Pleasure gardens, fireworks, balls, card parties. If you grow bored of one, there is always another to replace it. 
I've often spent an evening simply travelling from one engagement to the next, enjoying the food from one, the company in another, the entertainment in the third, and the wine in all of them. Mr. Sinclair laughed and winked. I keep my private secretary quite busy managing everything, and I cannot wait to show it all to you. Dotty tried to smile as he expounded on all the joys to be found in that great city, but the more he spoke, the more certain she felt that that life was not for her. A taste of finery in society was well and good, but to glut himself on it sounded miserable. In a trice, they were beyond the church wall and winding their way through the graveyard past all the worn and ageing headstones. Morbid though it may be, Dotty had always found such places fascinating. She couldn't help but wonder about the stories behind each name listed on the headstones and gaze at the inherent beauty of the moss and ivy crawling across the weathered surfaces. Perhaps some might think it grim, but Dotty thought it beautiful. And in the farthest corner, nestled among a few trees and some of the oldest graves, sat a bench. Mr. St. Clair was breathing heavily when they arrived there, and Dotty settled him onto the seat. You are a dear. I fear I overestimated my strength, he said with a smile. We can fetch the carriage for you if you wish, she said. Yes, that would be grand, he replied, patting her hand. Then, with a wave of his other, he gestured at Philip. Please fetch it. But Dotty seized her bow's hand, holding him in place. I prefer that he remain. Mr. Sinclair's smile strained but he patted the seat beside him and motioned for her to join him. Now, what do you wish to speak to me about? Dotty took the seat beside her father. Philip remained standing, but when he tried to give her more distance, she caught his gaze and shook her head. So he moved to stand at her side and her heart settled once more. I wish to speak to you about London, Mr. Sinclair. Swallowing past the lump in her throat, Dotty refused to think of every argument against this course of action and leapt straight into the centre of it. I long to know you better and I would love to come with you for some weeks or months even, but I cannot leave my home. Mr. St. Clair's expression pinched, his brow cocking upward as he nodded at Philip. Is it your home you cannot leave? Or him? Both. I love him. Ridiculous, replied Mr. Sinclair with a scoff. You have so much more potential than that. With a world of possibilities at your feet, you mustn't waste your life on a tutor. Dotty stiffened, her brows pulling together, her heart twisted at the wretched words that strayed so close to the poisonous objections Philip had raised earlier. Reaching behind her, she realised he'd put more distance between them, and she took his hand in hers, pulling him closer. Do not speak of him in such a manner. I will not stand for it, she said, keeping a firm hold on him lest Philip drift away again. Feeling him close gave strength to her words, firming her resolve, though it quivered when she looked into Mr. St. Clair's burning gaze. His eyes narrowed. That is ridiculous, Dotty. You have been swayed by a fortune hunter. Can you not see how he is using you? That is enough. Dotty spoke with the same tone she'd heard Mother use many a time and she was pleased to see it had much of the same effect. The fellow paused, blinking at her, and so she continued. As I said, I wish to know you better. I do. But perhaps it would be better for us to exchange letters or have a few short visits before I come to stay for any length of time. Straightening, Mr. St. Clair frowned, casting a hard look at Philip. I see your bow tattled on me. Did he paint me in a villainous light, making me out to be some wretch who wishes to destroy your love? But that only drew a frown from Dotty. He told me the truth, something you ought to have done from the start. Mr. Sinclair huffed. Because your precious Ashbrooks have been such paragons of honesty, they are liars and are jealous of all I have. They want to keep you for themselves, so do not listen to a word they say against me. 
A chill swept through Dotty, and she scoured his expression, searching for any sign of the generous, gregarious fellow from their other meetings. Sifting through her limited knowledge about consumption, she wondered if it were like so many diseases known to alter a personality. Or perhaps his treatment had some effect on his mood, but she could not say with any certainty. This man was so entirely different, and the more Mr. Sinclair spoke, the harder his tone became. I didn't mean to distress you, she said. Then you ought not to say such ridiculous things. I thought you were a sensible creature. Now, you'll pack your things and be ready to leave at first light tomorrow. With that, Mr. Sinclair gave her a firm nod and rose to his feet. Dotty followed, her mouth hanging open. I will not. I wish to know you better, but I shan't uproot my life for a stranger. If you need to return to London, then we can write for a time, and then I might join you for a short visit. I am not sharing you with the likes of the Ashbrooks and a tutor, he said, giving her a hard stare. You must decide if you wish to remain here with them or take your rightful place. I will remain here. Dotty didn't wait for him to finish his threat, for there was no other answer she could or would give. It was immediate, certain, unshakable. Mr. Sinclair gaped, his eyes widening as he stared at her for several long, silent moments. Then, jabbing a finger at her, he said, Think carefully before you answer, Dotty. If you refuse to do as I bid, I shall leave and never see you again. You will be a stranger to your father, irrevocably cut off from my name and my money. Dotty shook her head, straightening her shoulders as she slid her arm through Philip's. There is no need to reconsider, Mr. St. Clair. The Ashbrooks are my family, sir, and this is the man I love, and no amount of money or gifts could persuade me to cut them from my life. If you do not understand that, then you are not the sort of man I wish to know. Mr. St. Clair paled, his eyes widening as though he could not comprehend that she would give such an answer, even though it was her second rejection. Despite the infirmity stealing away his strength, his muscles tensed as he jerked forward. The suddenness of it had Dotty stepping back, and before Mr. St. Clair could close the distance, Philip stood between them, warding him off. You have made a grave mistake, he spat, his features twisting until they were unrecognisable. You do not throw aside Sherborne Sinclair. I have not thrown you aside. I have said that I wish to know you better, but I shan't do it on your terms, sir. If you choose to cut me from your life, that is your decision. Dottie's heart wrenched and contorted, sensing what was to come, though she pleaded for some twist of fate to alter that course. She couldn't help but think of how this would be the second time in her life that this man would cast her aside, and though she tried to hold on to a placid expression, something of her distress must have shown, for Mr. St. Clair straightened with a mocking smile. I ought not to have questioned my first instinct with you. I was a fool to think you would amount to anything. Like the rest of my irritating relatives, you are not worth my time, he said with a sneer before turning away. Enjoy your life in the gutter. It's where you belong. Philip lunged forward, but Dotty grabbed him, pulling him to her. Leave him, she whispered. And though Philip tugged at her hold, it was only a half-hearted attempt. His gaze turned to her with such pain on her behalf that the tears Dotty had fought back couldn't remain hidden any longer. Burrowing into his hold, she stifled them with his waistcoat. His arms wrapped around her and Dotty longed for the peace she usually found there, but with Mr. St. Clair's words and behaviour still fresh in her mind, there was little comfort to be found. Oh, Dotty, he murmured and the pain in his voice allowed her to stem the tears. Please take me home, Philip. Chapter 14
thank the heavens for little miracles, for they did not cross paths with any acquaintances as they hurried down the path to Oak Hall. Dotty had gained her composure once more, but she could not maintain it if someone were to stop them and attempt conversation. Philip was at her side, lending her his strength in that quiet, stalwart manner of his, and Dotty held fast to him. Mr. Sinclair was a fool. She knew it, but hearing her father cast her aside once more stung far more than she'd thought it would. He was a stranger, yet those little words pierced her to the core. Her father did not want her. Dotty's lungs jerked and she stifled the tears trying to break forth again. Feeling the shift, Philip stiffened and rested his hand atop the one she had threaded through his arm. Shoving aside her morose thoughts, Dotty tried to give him a comforting smile, but her breaking point was fast approaching. Oak Hall came into view, and her steps quickened. When she reached the front door, she abandoned all caution and rushed up the stairs, gathering her skirts up as she rushed to the library. She burst through the door, and when mother and father rose from their seats, her heart broke free of its bindings. Flinging herself into their arms, she sobbed trying to explain it all but managing only one word in three. Forcing herself to calm down enough to speak the words she must, Dotty blurted, I am sorry. Thank you for taking me in. Thank you for being my parents. Thank you for loving me. For... But her words broke off as their arms tightened around her, surrounding her with the same love and acceptance they'd always freely given from the very moment she'd landed on Ambrose Ashbrook's doorstep. Philip clasped his hands behind his back, not so much for his comfort, but to keep them under control. Mr. St. Clair deserved punishment, but pummeling an old man who was both sick and weak wouldn't accomplish anything of value. It was more likely to leave him feeling worse than before, but Philip's hands itched to hurt the fella. Wandering down the stairs, he forced his feet towards the parlour and not out the front door. Though logic usually kept him even tempered, Philip was struggling to maintain control. Dotty's tears echoed in his mind, and his breathing quickened, and so he walked the length of the room, turning back and forth in hopes of burning out that wild energy within. Turning his thoughts to better places, Philip focused on Dotty and her parents upstairs. That was precisely where she was meant to be, and he sent out a silent prayer of gratitude that she had discovered it before Mr. St. Clair had a stronger hold on her heart. You left, Dotty's quiet voice ripped him from his musings, and Philip turned to find her standing in the doorway. Though her eyes were red, her tears were gone. Holding his gaze, she moved across the parlour, coming to stand before him. Her skirts wrapped around his legs, the scent of her lilac perfume filled his nose, and the world shifted, writing itself once more. You were having a private moment with your parents, he said with a wry smile. I did not belong there. Taking his hand in hers, Dotty lifted it to her lips and placed a kiss on the back. You belong in every one of my moments, Philip. Curling his arms around her, he rested his hands at the small of her back and Dotty gave a happy sigh, resting her head against his chest. Feeling better, he asked. Her breath shuddered, though her voice was clear. I feel wretched for putting my parents through such heartache. And for you as well. You didn't deserve to be treated so poorly. With an amused huff, Philip pressed a kiss to her head, telling her that she ought not to fret was useless, so he simply held her close, giving the only comfort he could. Straightening, Dotty faced him with a tremulous smile that might be considered playful, if not for the pain in her gaze. And I must admit that I cannot help but wonder what sort of daughter is abandoned not once, but twice by her father. Philip brushed a touch along the edge of her jaw. And whenever I am seized by thoughts of my father, what do you always tell me? Dotty's shoulders dropped and her dimple winked, a wry smile growing on her lips. That his sins were his own and he wasn't worthy of you and your mother. And he gently podded. Ducking her head to rest against his chest, Dotty burrowed into his hold once more before murmuring, Instead of focusing on one man, you ought to look at all the many others who love you of their own choice, rather than mere blood ties. Philip smiled, his arms tightening around her. Too right, 
Yes, but it is far easier to say than to believe, she mumbled. Then I shall have to tell you that again and again, as you have done for me. Leaning back, Philip drew Dottie's gaze upwards once more. You are so very loved by those who know you. That man only wanted a doll to drag about town, and you are so much more than that, my dearest Dottie. Her lips trembled, eyes brightening, and she leaned close to press her lips to his. That little touch struck him to the core, filling him with a strength that belied the delicate and sweet nature of the kiss. But then so did Dottie. She seemed so tender at times, yet there was a power to her, and Philip knew if he were to achieve any of his lofty goals in life, it would only happen with this woman at his side. With Dottie, he could do anything. Philip deepened the kiss, and Dottie lost herself in the bliss she found in his touch. For all that she had overused that word in the past, there was no better way to describe her present than blissful. There was no better place in the world than to be wrapped in Philip's arms, his lips pressed to hers. Her Philip, her love, it felt as though her heart extended beyond itself, filling her with more than she'd ever thought possible to feel. Had she any doubts about Philip, they would all be silenced, for this was not some infatuation or giddy token exchanged between silly people. Dotty loved Philip with all her heart. His kindness and patience, his logic and intelligence, even if it was lacking when it came to his own sense of worth. Dotty vowed to herself that she was going to do everything she could to help him see himself as she did, just as he would do for her when thoughts of Mr. St. Clair tried to poison her felicity. Her heart expanded even further as she thanked the twist of fate that had brought her to this very moment. Despite all the pain that had accompanied the journey, the destination was precisely where she ought to be. Tears rose to her eyes as she thought about the babe she'd been and what might have happened without her dear parents' intervention. That sad, abandoned child had found such a perfect place in the world. Their love surrounded her, filling her to the brim, and Dotty hoped somehow she might be worthy of the mighty gift she'd been given. Epilogue, three years later. Though Philip's work was done for the day, it would be some hours until Newland Mill closed and the machines next door thrummed through the building, making the floorboards vibrate. Though it took some getting used to, the constant noise had become like an old friend and the air seemed empty during the night when the mill slept. Though the dark wood panelling and narrow hallways of Newland Place absorbed the light, giving the townhouse a dour appearance, the mill's machinery made the building buzz with energy and life. Taking the stairs, Philip wandered to the library and spied his wife's skirts peeking out from her hiding place. Sneaking across the room, he crept up on her, but a squeak of a floorboard betrayed him. Dotty looked up from the book propped on her lap and she broke into a smile. Philip gave her a quick bus and then crouched to peer into the bassinet on the floor beside her. Careful not to wake the babe, he caressed his son's cheek and then pressed a kiss there. Dotty shifted, giving him space enough to join her on the window seat. The nook was hardly big enough for one of them, let alone the pair, but Philip wasn't about to complain over being cuddled up close to his wife. Were my brothers as horrible as ever, she asked, placing her bookmark and setting the novel aside. With a heavy sigh, Philip shook his head. Not as bad as all that, with Vincent in his clerkship and Lucas not around to stir them up. Conrad and Nathaniel aren't difficult to manage. But I think Conrad would do better spending more time with your father in the mill. He seems keen to learn the ropes, and he's growing bored with the classroom. I know your father hopes Lucas will return from London and take up the reins, but I fear the business will fail under his leadership. Dotty shifted so that she could rest her head against his shoulder as he expounded on all the many things that had happened. The boys were a handful, but truly they were good children with much potential. Philip's gaze fell to a few sheets of paper wedged between her skirts and the window and nodded at it. Who is that from? he asked. 
nobody important. But when Philip pressed the issue, Dotty sighed and snatched up the papers, handing them over with a frown. Wrinkling her nose, she said, Mr. Sinclair has passed. Setting the papers aside, Philip rested a hand on her knee. Dotty straightened, giving him a brittle smile, shaking her head as though nothing were amiss, but he saw the tension in her shoulders and the sadness in her eyes. His lawyer wrote to inform me of the news and included a brief note, Mr. Sinclair wrote not long after we met. The man simply had to send one final missive to assure me how great a disappointment I was to him. Oh, dearest. Dotty lifted a hand to forestall him. I will not lie, she said. It pains me some. Curiosity got the better of me and I read a few words but I refuse to allow him to make me unhappy. I do not regret my life. I simply am sorry he never found happiness in his... Turning the letter over, Philip was about to cast it aside, but there were quite a few pages to it. More than one would expect of a short missive, and with a substantial amount of writing that did not look to be from the same hand. Setting aside Mr. Sinclair's note, he turned his attention to the others, his eyes darted across the page, his mouth gaping open. Did you not read the rest of it? Dotty shook her head and leaned closer to read over his shoulder. I assumed it was more vitriol, she replied. What does it say? He left you some money and his lawyer is asking for directions to our bank. I find that hard to believe, said Dotty. Mr. Sinclair was adamant he wouldn't give me a cent. Reaching forward, Dotty took the papers and Philip released them. Her lips moved as she scanned the lines. The lawyer echoed many of his employer's poor opinions of Dotty, and Philip longed to crumple the hateful thing. But then they arrived at the portion that was copied verbatim from Mr. St. Clair's will. To my daughter, who cast aside all the many things I wish to give her and has proved to be a disappointment of the highest order, Dotty mumbled a few words, then added, He goes on for a few lines about how I might have inherited all his vast lands and holdings had I not been so foolish, and on and on, just as he did with all the other useless heirs and heiresses he passed over. Her voice drifted off, and then she straightened. To her, I give one thousand pounds. Dropping the letter on her lap, Dotty gaped, turning to meet Philip's wide eyes. One thousand pounds, Philip let out a startled laugh. Between the necklace he gifted me and this money. Her words drifted off, her thoughts clearly speeding through the same calculations Philip was making. Shooting to his feet, he snatched her up in an embrace, spinning her about the room as Dotty laughed and squeezed his neck. Landing her back on her feet, Philip seized her in a kiss, which she met with equal urgency. Is it possible? Dottie's tone was as breathless as Philip felt. Can we afford the school? I think it prudent to wait another year, he said, but there is no reason we cannot begin to search for properties. Dottie beamed, her eyes brimming with tears. Bless that wretched man. Pressing another kiss to her lips, Philip feathered kisses along her jaw. And bless my wonderful wife. Would she ever grow accustomed to such sweetness? Dotty hoped not, just as she hoped she never tired of being held by her husband. Little Graham stirred, his squawks growing into cries, and Philip released her, lifting the babe from the bassinet and nestling him in his arms. Rubbing at his eyes, Graham blinked at his father and broke into a smile that showed off his new tooth. You wish to be part of the celebrations, little man? asked Philip, bouncing the boy in his arms as he took Dotty in a modified waltz hold, spinning the three of them around. No doubt Mr. St. Clair considered the paltry sum a punishment when compared to the rest of his fortune, but what did it matter? His cruelty had brought them within touching distance of their dream. With his first dismissal, the man had thrown her into the path of a new and wonderful family.
With the second, he'd shown her the breadth of her blessing, giving her a deeper love and understanding of her place in the world. And with his final one, he'd fulfilled her dream, resting her head against Philip's shoulder as they turned about the room. Dottie felt joyful tears gathering in her eyes as she contemplated the dear little family they'd made together and the many blessings she had and the many more to come. This has been A Twist of Fate, written by M. A. Nichols. Copyright 2022 by M. A. Nichols. Production copyright 2023 by M. A. Nichols.